Chapter Seven of the Invasion by William Le This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Weiss. Chapter Seven: Germans Sacking the Banks. Day dawned dismally and wet on September the twenty-first. Over London the sky was still obscured by the smoke pall, though as the night passed many of the raging fires had spent themselves. Trafalgar Square was filled with troops who had piled arms and were standing at their ease. The men were laughing and smoking, enjoying a rest after the last forward movement and the street fighting of that night of horrors. The losses on both sides during the past three days had been enormous. Of the number of London citizens killed and wounded, it was impossible to calculate. There had, in the northern suburbs, been wholesale butchery everywhere, so gallantly had the barricades been defended. Great camps had now been formed in Hyde Park, in the Green Park between Constitution Hill and Piccadilly, and in St. James's Park. The Magdeburg Fusiliers were being formed up on the House Guards Parade, and from the flagstaff there now fluttered the ensign of the commander of an army corps in place of the British flag. A large number of Uhlans and Coursiers were encamped at the west end of the park, opposite Buckingham Palace, and both the Wellington Barracks and the Cavalry Barracks at Knightsbridge were occupied by Germans. Many officers were already billeted in the Savoy, the Cecil, the Carlton, the Grand and Victoria Hotels, while the British Museum, the National Gallery, the South Kensington Museum, the Tower, and a number of other collections of pictures and antiques were all guarded strongly by German sentries. The enemy had thus seized our national treasures. London awoke to find herself a German city. In the streets lounging groups of travel-worn sons of the fatherland were everywhere, and German was heard on every hand. Every ounce of foodstuff was being rapidly commandeered by hundreds of foraging parties who went to each grocer's, baker's, or provision shop in the various districts, seized all they could find, valued it, and gave official receipts for it. The price of food in London that morning was absolutely prohibitive, as much as two shillings being asked for a two-penny loaf. The Germans had, it was afterwards discovered, been all the time since the Sunday when they landed, running over large cargoes of supplies of all sorts to the Essex, Lincolnshire and Norfolk coast, where they had established huge supply bases, well knowing that there was not sufficient food in the country to feed their armed hordes in addition to the population. Shops in Tottenham Court Road, Holborn, Edgware Road, Oxford Street, Camden Road and Harrow Road were systematically visited by the foraging parties who commenced their work at dawn. Those places that were closed and their owners absent were at once broken open, and everything seized and cartered to either Hyde Park or St. James's Park, for though Londoners might starve, the Kaiser's troops intended to be fed. In some cases a patriotic shopkeeper attempted to resist. Indeed, in more than one case a tradesman willfully set his shop on fire rather than its contents should fall into the enemy's hands. In other cases, the tradesmen who received the official German receipts burned them in contempt before the officer's eyes. The guidance of these foraging parties was, in very many cases, in the hands of Germans in civilian clothes, and it was now seen how complete and helpful the enemy system of espionage had been in London. Most of these men were Germans who, having served in the army, had come over to England and obtained employment as waiters, clerks, bakers, hairdressers, and private servants, and, being bound by their oath to the fatherland, had served their country as spies. Each man, when obeying the imperial command to join the German arms, had placed in the lapel of his coat a button of a peculiar shape, with which he had long ago been provided, and by which he was instantly recognized as a loyal subject of the Kaiser. This huge body of German soldiers, who for years had passed in England as civilians, was, of course, of enormous use to von Kronhelm, for they acted as guides not only on the march and during the entry to London, but materially assisted in the victorious advance in the Midlands. Indeed, 
the Germans had for years kept a civilian army in England, and yet we had, ostrich-like, buried our heads in the sand and refused to turn our eyes to the grave peril that had for so long threatened. Systematically the Germans were visiting every shop and warehouse in the shopping districts and seizing everything edible they could discover. The enemy were taking the food from the mouths of the poor in East and South London, and as they went southward across the river so the populace retired, leaving their homes at the mercy of the ruthless invader. Upon all the bridges across the Thames stood German guards, and none were allowed to cross without permits. Soon after dawn von Kronhelm and his staff rode down Haverstock Hill with a large body of cavalry, and made his formal entry into London, first having an interview with the Lord Mayor, and an hour afterwards establishing his headquarters at the new war office in Whitehall, over which he hoisted his special flag as commander-in-chief. It was found that, though a good deal of damage had been done externally to the building, the interior had practically escaped save one or two rooms. Therefore the field marshal installed himself in the private room of the war minister, and telegraphic and telephonic communication was quickly established, while a wireless telegraph apparatus was placed upon the ruined summit of Big Ben for the purpose of communicating with Germany in case the cables were interrupted by being cut at sea. The day after the landing a similar apparatus had been erected on the monument of Yarmouth, and it had been daily in communication with the one at Bremen. The German left nothing to chance. The clubs in Pall Mall were now being used by German officers who lounged in easy chairs smoking and taking their ease, German soldiers being on guard outside. North of the Thames seemed practically deserted, save for the invaders who swarmed everywhere. South of the Thames the cowed and terrified populace were asking what the end was to be. What was the government doing? It had fled to Bristol and left London to its fate, they complained. What the German demands were was not known until the Daily Telegraph published an interview with Sir Claude Harrison, the Lord Mayor, which gave authentic details of them. They were as follows. 1. Indemnity of three hundred million pounds paid in ten annual installments. Two, until this indemnity is paid in full, German troops to occupy Edinburgh, Rosyth, Chatham, Dover, Portsmouth, Devonport, Pembroke, Yarmouth, Hull. Three, cession to Germany of the Shetlands, Orkneys, Bantry Bay, Malta, Gibraltar, and Tasmania. Four, India, north of a line drawn from Calcutta to Baroda, to be ceded to Russia. 5. The independence of Ireland, to be recognized. Of the claim of three hundred million pounds, fifty millions was demanded from London, the sum in question to be paid within twelve hours. The Lord Mayor had, it appeared, sent his secretary to the Prime Minister at Bristol, bearing the original document in the handwriting of von Kronhelm. The Prime Minister had acknowledged its receipt by telegraph both to the Lord Mayor and to the German Field Marshal, but there the matter had ended. The twelve hours' grace was nearly up, and the German commander, seated in Whitehall, had received no reply. In the corner of the large, pleasant, well-carpeted room sat a German telegraph engineer with a portable instrument in direct communication with the Emperor's private cabinet Potsdam, and over that wire messages were continually passing and repassing. The grizzled old soldier paced the room impatiently. His Emperor had only an hour ago sent him a message of warm congratulation, and had privately informed him of the high honors he intended to bestow upon him. The German eagle was victorious, and London, the great unconquerable London, lay crushed torn and broken. The marble clock upon the mantelpiece shelf chimed eleven upon its silvery bells, causing von Kronhelm to turn from the window to glance at his own watch. "'Tell His Majesty it is eleven o'clock, and that there is no reply to hand,' he said sharply in German to the man in uniform seated at the table in the corner. The instrument clicked rapidly, and a silence followed. The German commander waited anxiously. 
He stood bending slightly over the green tape in order to read the imperial order the instant it flashed from beneath the sea. Five minutes, ten minutes passed. The shouting of military commands in German came up from Whitehall below. Nothing else broke the quiet. Von Kronhelm, his face more furrowed and more serious, again paced the carpet. Suddenly the little instrument whirred and clicked as its thin green tape rolled out. In an instant the generalissimo of the Kaiser's army sprang to the telegraphist's side and read the imperial command. For a moment he held the piece of tape between his fingers, then crushed it in his hand and stood motionless. He had received orders which, though against his desire, he was compelled to obey. Summoning several members of his staff who had installed themselves in other comfortable rooms in the vicinity, he held a long consultation with them. In the meantime, telegraphic dispatches were received from Sheffield, Manchester, Birmingham, and other German headquarters, all telling the same story, the complete investment and occupation of the big cities and the pacification of the inhabitants. One hour's grace was, however, allowed to London till noon. Then orders were issued, bugles rang out across the parks, and in the main thoroughfares where arms were piled, causing the troops to fall in, and within a quarter of an hour large bodies of infantry and engineers were moving along the strand in the direction of the city. At first the reason of all this was a mystery, but very shortly it was realized what was intended when a detachment of the 5th Hanover Regiment advanced to the gate of the Bank of England opposite the exchange, and, after some difficulty, broke it open and entered, followed by some engineers of von Mirbach's division. The building was very soon occupied, and, under the direction of General von Kleppert himself, an attempt was made to open the strong rooms wherein was stored that vast hoard of England's wealth. What actually occurred at that spot can only be imagined as the commander of the Fourth Army Corps and one or two officers and men were the only persons present. It is surmised, however, that the strength of the vaults was far greater than they had imagined, and that, though they worked for hours, all was in vain. While this was in progress, however, parties of engineers were making organized raids upon the banks in Lombard Street, Lothbury, Moorgate Street, and Broad Street, as well upon branch banks in Oxford Street, the Strand, and other places in the West End. At one bank on the left-hand side of Lombard Street, dynamite being used to force the strong room, the first bullion was seized, while at nearly all the banks sooner or later the vaults were opened, and great bags and boxes of gold coin were taken out and conveyed in carefully guarded carts to the Bank of England, now in the possession of Germany. In some banks, those of more modern construction, the greatest resistance was offered by the huge steel doors and concrete and steel walls and other devices for security. But nothing could, alas, resist the high explosives used, and in the end breaches were made, in all cases, and wealth uncounted and untold extracted and conveyed to Threadneedle Street for safekeeping. Engineers and infantry handled those heavy boxes and those big bundles of securities gleefully, Officers carefully counted each box or bag or packet as it was taken out to be carted or carried away by hand. German soldiers under guard struggled along Lothbury beneath great burdens of gold and carts requisitioned out of the east and rumbled heavily all the afternoon, escorted by soldiers. Hammersmith, Camberwell, Hampstead, and Williston yielded up their quota of the great wealth of London, but though soon after four o'clock a breach was made in the strong rooms of the Bank of England by means of explosives, nothing in the vaults was touched. The Germans simply entered there and formally took possession. The coin collected from other banks was carefully kept, each separate from another, and placed in various rooms under strong guards, for it seemed to be their intention simply to hold London's wealth as security. That afternoon very few banks, except the German ones, escaped notice. Of course there were a few small branches in the suburbs which remained unvisited, yet by six o'clock von Kronhelm was in possession of enormous quantities of gold. 
In one or two quarters there had been opposition on the part of the armed guards established by the banks at the first news of the invasion. But any such resistance had, of course, been futile, and the man who had dared to fire upon the German soldiers had in every case been shot down. Thus, when darkness fell, von Kronhelm, from the corner of his room in the war office, was able to report to his imperial majesty that not only had he occupied London, but that, receiving no reply to his demand for indemnity, he had sacked it and taken possession not only of the Bank of England, but of the cash deposits in most of the other banks in the metropolis. That night the evening papers described the wild happenings of the afternoon, and London saw herself not only shattered but ruined. The frightened populace across the river stood breathless. What was now to happen? Though London lay crushed and occupied by the enemy, though the Lord Mayor was a prisoner of war and the banks in the hands of the Germans, though the metropolis had been wrecked and more than half its inhabitants had fled southward and westward into the country, yet the enemy received no reply to their demand for an indemnity and the cession of British territory. Von Kronhelm, ignorant of what had happened in the House of Commons at Bristol, sat in Whitehall and wondered. He knew well that the English were no fools, and their silence, therefore, caused him considerable uneasiness. He had lost in the various engagements over fifty thousand men, yet nearly two hundred thousand still remained. His army of invasion was a no mean responsibility, especially when at any moment the British might regain command of the sea. His supplies and reinforcements would then be at once cut off. It was impossible for him to live upon the country, and his food bases in Suffolk and Essex were not sufficiently extensive to enable him to make a prolonged campaign. Indeed, the whole scheme of operations which had been so long discussed and perfected in secret in Berlin was more of the nature of a raid than a prolonged siege. City of London Citizens of London We, the general commanding the German Imperial Army, occupying London, give notice that. 1. The state of war and siege continues to exist, and all categories of crime, more especially the contravention of all orders already issued, will be judged by councils of war and punished in conformity with martial law. 2. The inhabitants of London and its suburbs are ordered to instantly deliver up all arms and ammunition of whatever kind they possess. The term arms includes firearms, sabers, swords, daggers, revolvers, and sword canes. Landlords and occupiers of the houses are charged to see that this order is carried out, but in the case of their absence, the municipal authorities and officials of the London County Council are charged to make domiciliary visits, minute and searching, being accompanied by a military guard. 3. All newspapers, journals, gazettes, and proclamations, of whatever description, are hereby prohibited, and until further notice nothing further must be printed except documents issued publicly by the military commander. 4. Any private person or persons taking arms against the German troops after this notice will be executed. 5. On the contrary, the imperial German troops will respect private property and no requisition will be allowed to be made unless it bears the authorization of the commander-in-chief. 6. All public places are to be closed at 8 p.m. All persons found in the streets of London after 8 p.m. will be arrested by the patrols. There is no exception to this rule, except in the case of German officers and also in the case of doctors visiting their patients. Municipal officials will also be allowed out providing they obtain a permit from the German headquarters. 7. Municipal authorities must provide for the lighting of the streets. In cases where this is impossible, each householder must hang a lantern outside his house from nightfall until 8 a.m. 8. After tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock, the women and children of the populace of London will be allowed to pass without hindrance. 9. Municipal authorities must, with as little delay as possible, provide accommodation for the German troops in private dwellings, in fire stations, barracks, hotels, and houses that are still habitable. Von Kronhelm, Commander-in-Chief, German Military Headquarters, 
Whitehall, London, September 21, 1910. The German field marshal sat alone and reflected. Had he been aware of the true state of affairs, he would certainly have had considerable cause for alarm. True, though Lord Byfield had made such a magnificent stand, considering the weakness of the force at his disposal, and London was occupied, yet England was not conquered. No news had leaked out from Bristol. Indeed, Parliament had taken every precaution that its deliberations were in secret. The truth, however, may be briefly related. On the previous day the House had met at noon in the Colston Hall, a memorable sitting indeed. The Secretary of State for War had, after prayers, risen in the hall and read an official dispatch he had just received from Lord Byfield, giving the news of the last stand made by the British north of Enfield and the utter hopelessness of the situation. It was received by the assembled house in ominous silence. During the past week through that great hall the minister's deep voice, shaken by emotion, had been daily heard as he was compelled to report defeat after defeat of the British arms. Both sides of the house had, after the first few days, been forced to recognize Germany's superiority in numbers, in training, in organization, in fact, in everything appertaining to military power. Von Kronhelm's strategy had been perfect. He knew more of eastern England than the British commander himself, and his marvelous system of spies and advanced agents, Germans who had lived for years in England, had assisted him forward until he had now occupied London, the city declared to be impregnable. Through the whole of September 20 the minister constantly received dispatches from the British Field Marshal and from London itself, yet each telegram communicated to the House seemed more hopeless than its predecessor. The debate, however, proceeded through the afternoon. The opposition were bitterly attacking the government and the Blue Water School for its gross negligence in the past, and demanding to know the whereabouts of the remnant of the British Navy. The First Lord of the Admiralty flatly refused to make any statement. The whereabouts of our Navy at that moment was, he said, a secret which must at all hazards be withheld from our enemy. The Admiralty were not asleep as the country believed, but were fully alive to the seriousness of the crisis. He urged the House to remain patient, saying that as soon as he dared he would make a statement. This was greeted by loud jeers from the opposition, from whose benches members, one after another, rose and using hard epithets blamed the government for the terrible disaster. The cutting down of our defenses, the meager naval programs, the discouragement of the volunteers and of recruiting, and the disregard of Lord Robert's scheme in 1906 for universal military training were, they declared, responsible for what had occurred. The government had been culpably negligent, and Mr. Haldane's scheme had been all insufficient. Indeed, it had been nothing short of criminal to mislead the empire into a false sense of security which did not exist. For the past three years Germany, while sapping our industries, had sent spies into our midst and laughed at us for our foolish insular superiority. She had turned her attention from France to ourselves, notwithstanding the Entente Cordiale. She remembered how the much-talked-of Franco-Russian alliance had fallen to pieces and relied upon a similar outcome of the friendship between France and Great Britain. The aspect of the house, too, was strange. The speaker in his robes looked out of place in his big uncomfortable chair and members sat on cane-bottom chairs instead of their comfortable benches at Westminster. As far as possible, the usual arrangement of the House was adhered to, except that the press were now excluded, official reports being furnished to them at midnight. The clerk's table was a large plain one of stained wood, but upon it was the usual array of dispatches, while the sergeant-at-arms in his picturesque dress was still one of the most prominent figures. The lack of committee rooms, of an adequate lobby, and of a refreshment department caused much inconvenience, though a temporary post and telegraph office had been established within the building, and a separate line connected the Prime Minister's room with Downing Street. If the government were denounced in unmeasured terms, its defense was eagerly vigorous. 
Thus, through that never-to-be-forgotten afternoon, the sitting continued past the dinner hour, on to late in the evening. Time after time the dispatches from London were placed in the hands of the war minister, but contrary to the expectation of the House, he vouchsafed no further statement. It was noticed that just before ten o'clock he consulted in an earnest undertone with the Prime Minister, the First Lord of the Admiralty, and the Home Secretary, and that a quarter of an hour later all four went out and were closeted in one of the smaller rooms with other members of the Cabinet for nearly half an hour. Then the Secretary of State for War re-entered the House and resumed his seat in silence. A few minutes afterwards Mr. Thomas Askern, member of one of the Metropolitan Boroughs, and a well-known newspaper proprietor, who had himself received several private dispatches, rose and received leave to put a question to the War Minister. "'I would like to ask the Right Honourable, the Secretary of State for War,' he said, "'whether it is not a fact that soon after noon today the enemy, having moved his heavy artillery to certain positions commanding North London, and finding the capital strongly barricaded, proceeded to bombard it. Whether that bombardment, according to the latest dispatches, is not still continuing at this moment, whether it is not a fact that enormous damage has already been done to many of the principal buildings of the metropolis, including the government offices at Whitehall, and whether great loss of life has not been occasioned. The question produced the utmost sensation. The House, during the whole afternoon, had been in breathless anxiety as to what was actually happening in London, but the government held the telegraphs and telephone, and the only private dispatches that had come to Bristol were the two received by some roundabout route, known only to the ingenious journalists who had dispatched them. Indeed, the dispatches had been conveyed the greater portion of the way by motor car. A complete silence fell. Every face was turned towards the war minister, who, seated with outstretched legs, was holding a fresh dispatch he had just received. He rose, and in his deep bass voice said, In reply to the honourable member from South East Brixton, the statement he makes appears, from information which has just reached me, to be correct. The Germans are, unfortunately, bombarding London. Von Kronhelm, it is reported, is at Hampstead, and the zone of the enemy's artillery reaches, in some cases, as far south as the Thames itself. It is true, as the Honourable Member asserts, an enormous amount of damage has already been done to various buildings, and there has undoubtedly been great loss of life. My latest information is that the non-combatant inhabitants, old persons, women and children, are in flight across the Thames, and that the barricades in the principal roads leading in from the north are held strongly by the armed populace driven back into London. He sat down without further word. A tall, thin, white-moustached man rose at that moment from the opposition side of the house. Colonel Farquhar, late of the Royal Marines, was a well-known military critic and represented West Bude. And this, he said, is the only hope of England? The defense of London by an armed mob? pitted against the most perfectly equipped and armed force in the world? Londoners are patriotic, I grant. They will die fighting for their homes, as every Englishman will when the moment comes. Yet what can we hope when patriotism is ranged against modern military science? There surely is patriotism in the savage negro races of Central Africa, a love of country perhaps as deep as in the white man's heart. Yet a little strategy, a few maxims, and all defence is quickly at an end. And so it must inevitably be with London. I contend, Mr. Speaker, he went on, that by the ill-advised action of the government from the first hour of their coming into power we now find ourselves conquered. It only remains for them now to make terms of peace as honourable to themselves as the unfortunate circumstances will admit. Let the country itself judge their actions in the light of events of today and let the blood of the poor, murdered women and children of London be upon their heads. Shame! To resist further is useless. Our military organization is in chaos. Our miserably weak army is defeated and in flight. I declare to this house that we should sue at this very moment for peace, 
a dishonorable peace though it be. But the bitter truth is too plain. England is conquered. As he sat down among the hear hears and the loud applause of the opposition, there rose a keen-faced, dark-haired, clean-shaven man of thirty-seven or so. He was Gerald Graham, younger son of an aristocratic house, the Yorkshire Grahams, who sat for Northeast Rutland. He was a man of brilliant attainments at Oxford, a splendid orator, a distinguished writer and traveller, whose keen brown eye, little upright figure, quick activity and smart appearance rendered him a born leader of men. For the past five years he had been marked out as a coming man. As a soldier he had seen hard service in the Boer War, being mentioned twice in dispatches. As an explorer he had led a party through the heart of the Congo and fought his way back to civilization through an unexplored land with valiant bravery that had saved the lives of his companions. He was a man who never sought notoriety. He hated to be lionized in society, refused the shoals of cards of invitation which poured in upon him, and stuck to his parliamentary duties and keeping faith with his constituents to the very letter. As he stood up silent for a moment, gazing around him fearlessly, he presented a striking figure, and in his navy serge suit he possessed the unmistakable cut of the smart, well-groomed Englishman who was also a man of note. The house always listened to him, for he never spoke without he had something of importance to say, and the instant he was up a silence fell. "'Mr. Speaker,' he said in a clear ringing voice, "'I entirely disagree with my honourable friend the member from West Butte. England is not conquered. She is not beaten. The great hall rang with loud and vociferous cheers. London may be invested and bombarded. She may even be sacked, but Englishmen will still fight for their homes and fight valiantly. If we have a demand for indemnity, let us refuse to pay it. Let us civilians, let the civilians in every corner of England, arm themselves and unite to drive out the invader. Loud cheers. I contend, Mr. Speaker, that there are millions of able-bodied men in this country who, if properly organized, will be able to gradually exterminate the enemy. Organization is all that is required. Our vast population will rise against the Germans, and before the tide of popular indignation and desperate resistance the power of the invader must soon be swept away. Do not let us sit calmly here in security and acknowledge that we are beaten. Remember, we have at this moment to uphold the ancient tradition of the British race, the honor of our forefathers who have never been conquered. Shall we acknowledge ourselves conquered in this the twentieth century? No, rose from the hundreds of voices, for the house was now carried away by young Graham's enthusiasm. Then let us organize, he urged. Let us fight on. Let every man who can use a sword or gun come forward, and we will commence hostilities against the Kaiser's forces that shall either result in their total extermination or in the power of England being extinguished. Englishmen will die hard. I myself will, with the consent of this house, head the movement, for I know that in the country we have millions who will follow me and will be equally ready to die for our country if necessary. Let us withdraw this statement that we are conquered. The real earnest fight is now to commence, he shouted, his voice ringing clearly through the hall. Let us bear our part, each one of us. If we organize and unite, we shall drive the Kaiser's hordes into the sea. They shall sue us for peace and be made to pay us an indemnity instead of us paying one to them. I will lead, he shouted. Who will follow me? In London the Lord Mayor's patriotic proclamations were now obliterated by a huge bill bearing the German imperial arms, the text of which told its own grim tale. In the meantime, the news of the fall of London was being circulated by the Germans to every town throughout the kingdom, their dispatches being embellished by lurid descriptions of the appalling losses inflicted upon the English. In Manchester a great poster, headed by the German imperial arms, was posted up on the town hall, the exchange, and other places, in which von Kronhelm announced the occupation of London, while in Leeds, Bradford, Stockport, and Sheffield 
Similarly worded official announcements were also posted. The press in all towns occupied by the Germans had been suppressed, papers only appearing in order to publish the enemy's orders. Therefore this official intelligence was circulated by proclamation, calculated to impress upon the inhabitants of the country how utterly powerless they were. Notice and Advice To the Citizens of London I address you seriously. We are neighbors, and in time of peace cordial relations have always existed between us. I therefore address you from my heart in the cause of humanity. Germany is at war with England. We have been forced to penetrate into your country. But each human life spared and all property saved we regard as in the interest of both religion and humanity. We are at war, and both sides have fought a loyal fight. Our desire is, however, to spare disarmed citizens and the inhabitants of all towns and villages. We maintain a severe discipline, and we wish to have it known that punishment of the severest character will be inflicted upon any one who are guilty of hostility to the imperial German arms, either open or in secret. To our regret, any incitements, cruelties, or brutalities we must judge with equal severity. I therefore call upon all local mayors, magistrates, clergy, and schoolmasters to urge upon the populace and upon the heads of families to urge upon those under their protection and upon their domestics to refrain from committing any act of hostility whatsoever against my soldiers. All misery avoided is a good work in the eye of our sovereign judge who sees all men. I earnestly urge you to heed this advice and I trust in you. Take notice. Von Kronhelm, commanding the Imperial German Army, German Military Headquarters, Whitehall, London, September 20, 1910. While von Kronhelm sat in that large somber room in the war office, with his telegraph instrument to Potsdam ever ticking, and the wireless telegraphy constantly in operation, he wondered and still wondered why the English made no response to his demands. He was in London. He had carried out his emperor's instruction to the letter. He had received the imperial thanks, and he held all the gold coin he could discover in London as security. Yet, without some reply from the British government, his position was an insecure one. Even his thousand and one spies who had served him so well ever since he had placed foot upon English soil could tell him nothing. The deliberations of the House of Commons at Bristol were a secret. In Bristol the hot, fevered night had given place to a gloriously sunny morning with a blue and cloudless sky. Above Lee Woods the lark rose high in the sky, trilling his song, and the bells of Bristol rang out as merrily as they ever did and above the Colston Hall still floated the royal standard, a sign that the house had not yet adjourned. While von Kronhelm held London, Lord Byfield and the remnant of the British army, who had suffered such defeat in Essex and north of London, had retreated to Chichester and Salisbury, where reorganization was in rapid progress. One division of the defeated troops had encamped at Horsham. The survivors of those who had fought the Battle of Charnwood Forest and had acted so gallantly in the defence of Birmingham, were now encamped on the Malvern Hills while the defenders of Manchester were at Shrewsbury. Speaking roughly, therefore, our vanquished troops were massing at four points in an endeavour to make a last attack upon the invader. The commander-in-chief, Lord Byfield, was near Salisbury, and at any hour he knew that the German legions must push westward from London to meet him and to complete the coup. The League of Defenders formed by Gerald Graham and his friends was, however, working independently. The wealthier classes who, driven out of London, were now living in cottages and tents in various parts of Burks, Wilts, and Hants worked unceasingly on behalf of the League, while into Plymouth, Exmouth, Swanage, Bristol, and Southampton more than one ship had already managed to enter, laden with arms and ammunition of all kinds, sent across by the agents of the League in France. The cargoes were of a very miscellaneous character, from modern maxims to old-fashioned rifles that had seen service in the War of 1870. 
there were hundreds of modern rifles, sporting guns, revolvers, swords, in fact, every weapon imaginable, modern and old-fashioned. These were at once taken charge of by the local branches of the League, and to those men who presented their tickets of identification the arms were served out and practice conducted in the open fields. Three shiploads of rifles were known to have been captured by German warships, one off Start Point, another a few miles out Padstow, and a third within sight of the Coast Guard at Selby Bill. Two other ships were blown up in the channel by drifting mines. The running of arms across from France and Spain was a very risky proceeding, yet the British skipper is nothing if not patriotic and every man who crossed the channel on those dangerous errands took his life in his hand. Into Liverpool, Whitehaven, and Milford, weapons were also coming over from Ireland, even though several German cruisers, who had been up to Lamlish to cripple the Glasgow trade, had now come south and were believed still to be in the Irish Sea. End of chapter 7 Recording by Tom Weiss Tom's Audiobooks dot com Chapter Eight of the Invasion by William LeCue. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Weiss. Chapter Eight: Defenses of South London. Preparations were being continued night and day to place the working-class districts in Southwark and Lambeth in a state of strong defense, and the constant meetings convened in public halls and chapels by the newly formed League of Defenders incited the people to their work. Everybody lent a willing hand, rich and poor alike. People who had hitherto lived in comfort in Regent's Park, Hampstead, or one of the other better-class northern suburbs, now found themselves herded among all sorts and conditions of men and women, and living as best they could in those dull drab streets of Lambeth, Walworth, Battersea, and Kennington. It was, indeed, a strange experience for them. In the sudden flight from the north, parents had become separated from their children and husbands from their wives, so that in many cases haggard and forlorn mothers were in frantic search of their little ones, fearing that they might have already died of starvation or been trampled underfoot by the panic-stricken multitudes. The dense population of South London had already been trebled. They were penned in by the barricades in many instances for each district seemed to be now placing itself in a state of defense, independent of any other. Kennington, for instance, was practically surrounded by barricades, tons upon tons of earth being dug from the Oval and the Park. Besides the barricades in Harleyford Road and Kennington Lane, all the streets converging on the Oval were blocked up, a huge defense arm just being completed across the junction of Kennington and Kennington Park Roads, and all the streets running into the latter thoroughfare from that point to the big obstruction at the Elephant were blocked by paving stones, bags of sand, barrels of cement, bricks, and such like odds and ends impervious to bullets. In addition to this there was a double fortification in Lambeth Road, a veritable redoubt, as well as the barricade at Lambeth Bridge, while all the roads leading from Kennington into Lambeth Road, such as St. George's Road, Kennington Road, High Street, and the rest had been rendered impassable and the neighboring houses placed in a state of defense. Thus the whole district of Kennington became, therefore, a fortress in itself. This was only a typical instance of the scientific methods of defense now resorted to. Mistakes made in North London were not now repeated. Day and night every able-bodied man, and woman too, worked on with increasing zeal and patriotism. The defences in Haverstock Hill, Holloway Road, and Edgware Road, which had been comprised of overturned tramcars, motor buses, household furniture, etc., had been riddled by the enemy's bullets. The lesson had been heeded, and now earth, sand, tiles, paving stones, and bricks were used. From nearly all the principal thoroughfares south of the river, the paving stones were being rapidly torn up by great gangs of men, and whenever the artillery brought up a fresh maxim or field gun the wildest demonstrations were made. The clergy held special services in churches and chapels, 
and prayer meetings for the emancipation of London were held twice daily in the Metropolitan Tabernacle at Newington. In Kennington Park, Camberwell Green, the Oval, Vauxhall Park, Lambeth Palace Gardens, Camberwell Park, Peckham Rye, and Southwark Park, a division of Lord Byfield's army was encamped. They held the Waterloo terminus of the Southwestern Railway strongly, the Chatham Railway from the Borough Road Station, now the terminus, the South Eastern from Bricklayer's Arms, which had been converted into another terminus, as well as the Brighton Line at Battersea Park and York Road. The lines destroyed by the enemy spies in the early moments of the invasion had long ago been repaired, and up to the present railway and telegraphic communication south and west remained uninterrupted. The Daily Telegraph had managed to transfer some of its staff to the offices of a certain printers in Southwark, and there, under difficulties, published several editions daily despite the German censorship. While North London was without any news except that supplied from German sources, South London was still open to the world, the cables from the South Coast being as yet in the hands of the British, and the telegraphs intact to Bristol and to all places in the West. Thus, during those stifling and exciting days following the occupation, while London was preparing for its great uprising, the South London Mirror, though a queer, unusual-looking sheet, still continued to appear, and was read with avidity by the gallant men at the barricade. Contrary to expectation, von Kronhelm was leaving South London severely alone. He was no doubt wise. Full well he knew that his men, once within those narrow, torturous streets beyond the river, would have no opportunity to maneuver, and would, as in the case of the assault of Waterloo Bridge, be slaughtered to a man. His spies reported that each hour that passed rendered the populace the stronger, yet he did nothing, devoting his whole time, energy, and attention to matters in that half of London he was now occupying. Everywhere the walls of South London were placarded with manifestos of the League of Defenders. Day after day fresh posters appeared, urging patience and courage, and reporting upon the progress of the League. The name of Graham was now upon everyone's lips. He had, it seemed, arisen as saviour of our beloved country. Every word of his inspired enthusiasm, and this was well illustrated at the mass meeting on Peckham Rye, when beneath the huge flag of St. George, the white banner with the red cross, the ancient standard of England, which the League had adopted as theirs, he made a brilliant and impassioned appeal to every Londoner and every Englishman. Report had it that the Germans had set a price upon his head, and that he was pursued everywhere by German spies, mercenaries who would kill him in secret if they could. Therefore he was compelled to go about with an armed police guard who arrested any suspected person in his vicinity. The government, who had at first laughed Graham's enthusiasm to scorn, now believed in him. Even Lord Byfield, after a long council, declared that his efforts to inspire enthusiasm had been amazingly successful, and it was now well known that the defenders and the army had agreed to act in unison towards one common end, the emancipation of England from the German thraldom. Some of the men of the Osnabrück Regiment, holding Canningtown and Limehouse managed one night by strategy, to force their way through the Blackwall Tunnel, and break down its defences on the Surrey side in an attempt to blow up the South Metropolitan Gas Works. The men holding the tunnel were completely overwhelmed by the number that pressed on, and were compelled to fall back, twenty of their number being killed. The assault was a victorious one, and it was seen that the enemy were pouring out, when of a sudden there was a dull, heavy roar, followed by wild shouts and terrified screams, as there rose from the centre of the river a great column of water, and next instant the tunnel was flooded, hundreds of the enemy being drowned like rats in a hole. The men of the Royal Engineers had, on the very day previous, made preparations for destroying the tunnel if necessary, and had done so ere the Germans were aware of their intention. The exact loss of life is unknown, but it is estimated that over four hundred men must have perished in that single instant while those who had made the sudden dash towards the gas works were all taken prisoners and their explosives confiscated. The evident intention of the enemy being thus seen, 
General Sir Francis Bamford, from his headquarters at the Crystal Palace, gave orders for the tunnels at Rotherhithe and that across Greenwich Reach, as well as the several tube tunnels and subways, to be destroyed, a work which was executed without delay and was witnessed by thousands who watched from the great disturbances and upheavals in the bed of the river. In the old Camp Road, the bridge over the canal, as well as the bridges in Well Street, Sumner Road, Glengall Road, and Canterbury Road were all prepared for demolition in case of necessity, the canal from the Camberwell Road to the Surrey Dock forming a moat behind which the defenders might, if necessary, retire. Clapham Common and Brockwell Park were covered with tents, for General Bamford's force, consisting mostly of auxiliaries, were daily awaiting reinforcements. Lord Byfield, now at Windsor, was in constant communication by wireless telegraphy with the London headquarters at the Crystal Palace, as well as with Hibbert on the Malvern Hills and Woolmer at Shrewsbury. To General Bamford at Sydenham came constant news of the rapid spread of the national movement of defiance, and Lord Byfield, as was afterwards known, urged the London commander to remain patient and invite no attack until the League were strong enough to act on the offensive. Affairs of outpost were, of course, constantly recurring along the river bank between Windsor and Egham, and the British free shooters and frontiersmen were ever harassing the Saxons. Very soon von Kronhelm became aware of Lord Byfield's intention, but his weakness was apparent when he made no counter move. The fact was that the various great cities he now held required all his attention and all his troops. From Manchester, from Birmingham, from Leeds, Bradford, Sheffield, and Hull came similar replies. Any withdrawal of troops from either city would be the signal for a general uprising of the inhabitants. Therefore, having gained possession, he could only now sit tight and watch. From all over Middlesex, and more especially from the London area, came sensational reports of the drastic measures adopted by the Germans to repress any signs of revolt. In secret the agents of the League of Defenders were at work, going from house to house, enrolling men, arranging for secret meeting-places, and explaining in confidence the program as put forth by the Bristol Committee. Now and then, however, these agents were betrayed, and their betrayal was in every case followed by a court-martial at Bow Street, death outside in the yard of the police station, and the publication in the papers of their names, their offence and the hour of the execution. Yet, undaunted and defiantly, the giant organization grew as no other society had ever grown, and its agents and members quickly developed into fearless patriots. It being reported that the Saxons were facing Lord Byfield with the Thames between them, the people of West London began in frantic haste to construct barricades. The building of obstructions had, indeed, now become a mania north of the river as well as south. The people, fearing that there was to be more fighting in the streets of London, began to build huge defences all across West London. The chief were across King Street, Hammersmith, where it joins Goldhawk Road, across the junction of Goldhawk and Uxbridge Roads, in the Harrow Road where it joins Admiral Road, and Willesden Lane, close to Paddington Cemetery, and the Latimer Road opposite St. Quentin Park Station. All the side streets leading into the Goldhawk Road, Latimer Road, and Ladbroke Grove Road were also blocked up, and hundreds of houses placed in a state of strong defense. With all this von Kronhelm did not interfere. The building of such obstructions acted as a safety valve to the excited populace, therefore he rather encouraged them than discountenanced it. The barricades might, he thought, be of service to his army, if Lord Byfield really risked an attack upon London from that direction. Crafty and cunning though he was, he was entirely unaware that those barricades were being constructed at the secret orders of the League of Defenders, and he never dreamed that they had actually been instigated by the British commander-in-chief himself. Thus the day of reckoning hourly approached and London, though crushed and starving, waited in patient vigilance. At Enfield Chase was a great camp of British prisoners in the hands of the Germans, amounting to several thousands. Contrary to report, both officers and men were fairly well treated by the Germans, 
though with his limited supplies von Kronhelm was already beginning to contemplate releasing them. Many of the higher-grade officers who had fallen into the hands of the enemy, together with the Lord Mayor of London, the Mayors of Hull, Goole, Lincoln, Norwich, Ipswich, and the Lord Mayors of Manchester and Birmingham, had been sent across to Germany, where, according to their own reports, they were being detained in Hamburg and treated with every consideration. Nevertheless, all this greatly incensed Englishmen. Lord Byfield, with Hibbert and Woolmer, was leaving no stone unturned in order to reform our shattered army, and again oppose the invaders. All three gallant officers had been to Bristol, where they held long consultation with members of the cabinet, with the result that the government still refused to entertain any idea of paying the indemnity. The Admiralty were confident now that the command of the sea had been regained, and in Parliament itself a little confidence was also restored. Yet we had to face the hard facts, that nearly two hundred thousand Germans were upon British soil, and that London was held by them. Already parties of German commissioners had visited the National Gallery, the Wallace Collection, the Tate Gallery, and the British and South Kensington Museums, deciding upon and placing aside certain art treasures and priceless antiques ready for shipment to Germany. The Raphaels, the Titians, the Rubenis, the Fra Angelicos, the Velasquezes, the Elgin Marbles, the best of the Egyptian Assyrian and Roman antiques, the Rosetto Stone, the early biblical and classical manuscripts, the historic charters of England and such like treasures which could never be replaced, were all catalogued and prepared for removal. The people of London knew this, for though there had been no newspapers, information ran rapidly from mouth to mouth. German sentries guarded our world-famous collections, which were now indeed entirely in the enemy's hands, and which the Kaiser intended should enrich the German galleries and museums. One vessel flying the British flag had left the Thames laden with spoil in an endeavor to reach Hamburg, but off Harwich she had been sighted and overhauled by a British cruiser, with the result that she had been steered to Dover. Therefore our cruisers and destroyers, having thus obtained knowledge of the enemy's intentions, were keeping a sharp lookout about the coast for any vessels attempting to leave for German ports. Accounts of fierce engagements in the channel between British and German ships went the rounds, but all were vague and unconvincing. The only solid facts were that the Germans held the great cities of England, and that the millions of Great Britain were slowly but surely preparing to rise in an attempt to burst asunder the fetters that now held them. Government, army, navy, and parliament had all proved rotten reeds. It was now every man for himself, to free himself and his loved ones, or to die in the attempt. Through the south and west of England Graham's clear, manly voice was raised everywhere, and the whole population were now fast assembling beneath the banner of the defenders in readiness to bear their part in the most bloody and desperate encounter of the whole war. The swift and secret death being meted out to the German sentries, or in fact to any German caught alone in a side street, having been reported to von Kronhelm, he issued another of his now famous proclamations, which was posted upon half the hoardings in London. But the populace at once amused themselves by tearing it down wherever it was discovered. Von Kronhelm was the arch enemy of London, and it is believed that there were at that moment no fewer than five separate conspiracies to encompass his death. Londoners detested the Germans, but with a hatred twenty times the more intense did they regard those men who, having engaged in commercial pursuits in England, had joined the colors and were now acting as spies. End of chapter 8 Recording by Tom Weiss Tom's Audiobooks dot com Chapter Nine of the Invasion by William Lequeux. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Weiss. Chapter Nine, Revolts in Shoreditch and Islington. On the night of September twenty-seven, a very serious conflict entailing much loss of life on both the London civilian and German side 
occurred at the point where Kingsland Road joins Old Street, Hackney Road, and High Street. Across both Hackney and Kingsland Roads, the barricades built before the bombardment still remained in a half-ruined state, and he attempted clearing them away being repulsed by the angry inhabitants. Dalston, Kingsland, Bethnal Green, and Shoreditch were notably antagonistic to the invaders, and several sharp encounters had taken place. Indeed, those districts were discovered by the enemy to be very unsafe. The conflict in question, however, commenced at the corner of Old Street about 9.30 in the evening, by three German tailors from Cambridge Road being insulted by two men, English laborers. The tailors appealed in German to four Westphalian infantrymen who chanced to be passing, and who subsequently fired and killed one of the Englishmen. This was the signal for a local uprising. The alarm given, hundreds of men and women rushed from their houses, many of them armed with rifles and knives, and taking cover behind the ruined barricades, opened fire upon a body of fifty Germans who were very quickly ran up. The fire was returned, when from the neighboring houses a perfect hail of lead was suddenly rained upon the Germans, who were then forced to retire down High Street towards Liverpool Street Station, leaving many dead. Very quickly news was sent over the telephone, which the Germans had now established in many quarters of London, and large reinforcements were soon upon the scene. The men of Shoreditch had, however, obtained two Maxim guns which had been secreted ever since the entry of the Germans into the metropolis, and as the enemy endeavored to storm their position they swept the street with a deadly fire. Quickly the situation became desperate, but the fight lasted over an hour. The sound of firing brought hundreds upon hundreds of Londoners upon the scene. All these took arms against the Germans, who, after many fruitless attempts to storm the defenses, and being fired upon from every side, were compelled to fall back again. They were followed along High Street into Bethnal Green Road, up Great Eastern Street into Hoxton Square and Pitfield Street, and there cut up, being given no quarter at the hands of the furious populace. In those narrow thoroughfares they were powerless, and were therefore simply exterminated. The victory for the men of Shoreditch was complete, over three hundred and fifty Germans being killed, while our losses were only about fifty. The conflict was at once reported to von Kronhelm, and the very fact that he did not send exemplary punishment into that quarter was sufficient to show that he feared to arouse further the hornet's nest in which he was living and more especially that portion of the populace north of the city. News of the attack quickly spreading inspired courage in every other part of the oppressed metropolis. The successful uprising against the Germans in Shoreditch incited Londoners to rebel, and in various other parts of the metropolis there occurred outbreaks. Von Kromhelm had found to his cost that London was not to be so easily cowed after all. The size and population of the metropolis had not been sufficiently calculated upon. It was as a country in itself, while the intricacies of its byways formed a refuge for the conspirators who were gradually completing their preparations to rise and mass and strike down the Germans wherever found. In the open country his great army could march, maneuver, and use strategy. But here, in the maze of narrow London streets, it was impossible to know in one thoroughfare what was taking place in the next. Supplies, too, were now running very short. The distress among our vanquished populace was most severe, while von Kronhelm's own army was put on meager rations. The increasing price of food and consequent starvation had not served to improve the relations between the invaders and the citizens of London, who, though they were assured by various proclamations that they would be happier and more prosperous under German rule, now discovered that they were being slowly starved to death. Their only hope, therefore, was in the efforts of that now gigantic organization, the League of Defenders. A revolt occurred in Pentonville Road, opposite King's Cross Underground Station, which ended in a fierce and terrible fray. A company of the Bremen Infantry Regiment No. 75, belonging to the Ninth Corps, were marching from the city road towards Regent's Park, when several shots were fired at them from windows of shops almost opposite the station five Germans fell dead, including one lieutenant, a very gorgeous person who wore a monocle. 
another volley rang out before the infantrymen could realize what was happening, and then it was seen that the half-ruined shops had been placed in such a state of defense as to constitute a veritable fortress. The fire was returned, but a few moments later a maxim spat its deadly fire from a small hole in a wall, and a couple of dozen of the enemy fell upon the granite sets of the thoroughfare. The rattle of musketry quickly brought forth the whole of that populous neighborhood, or all, indeed, that remained of them, the working-class district between Pentonville Road and Copenhagen Street. Quickly the fight became general. The men of Bremen endeavored to take the place by assault, but found that it was impossible. The strength of the defenses were amazing, and showed only too plainly that Londoners were in secret preparing for the great uprising that was being planned. In such a position were the houses held by the Londoners that their fire commanded both the Pentonville and King's Cross roads, but very soon the Germans were reinforced by another company of the same regiment, and these being attacked in the rear from Rodney Street, Cumming Street, Weston Street, York Street, Winchester Street, and other narrow turnings leading into the Pentonville Road, the fighting quickly became general. The populace came forth in swarms, men and women, armed with any weapon or article upon which they could lay their hands, and all fired with the same desire. Hundreds of men who came forth were armed with rifles which had been carefully secreted on the entry of the enemy into the metropolis. The greater part of these men, indeed, had fought at the barricades in North London, and had subsequently taken part in the street fighting as the enemy advanced. Some of the arms had come from the League of Defenders, smuggled into the metropolis nobody exactly knew how. Up and down the King's Cross, Pentonville and Caledonian roads the crowd swayed and fought. The Germans against that overwhelming mass of angry civilians seemed powerless. Small bodies of the troops were cornered in the narrow by-streets and then given no quarter. Brave-hearted Londoners, though they knew well what dire punishment they must inevitably draw upon themselves, had taken the law into their own hands and were shooting or stabbing every German who fell into their hands. The scene of carnage in that hour of fighting was awful. The Daily Chronicle described it as one of the most fiercely contested encounters in the whole history of the siege. Shoreditch had given courage to King's Cross, for unknown to von Kronhelm, houses in all quarters were being put in a state of defense, their position being carefully chosen by those directing the secret operations of the League of Defenders. For over an hour the houses in question gallantly held out, sweeping the streets constantly with their maxim. Presently, however, on further reinforcements arriving, the German colonel directed his men to enter the houses opposite. In an instant a door was broken in, and presently glass came tumbling down as muzzles of rifles were poked through the panes, and soon sharp crackling showed that the Germans had settled down to their work. The defense of the Londoners was most obstinate. In the streets Londoners attacked the enemy with utter disregard for the risks they ran. Women, among them many young girls, joined in the fray, armed with pistols and knives. After a while, a great body of reinforcements appeared in the Euston Road, having been sent hurriedly along from Regent's Park. Then the option was given to those occupying the fortified house to surrender, the colonel promising to spare their lives. The Londoners peremptorily refused. Everywhere the fighting became more desperate, and spread all through the streets leading out of St. Pancras, York, and Caledonian Roads, until the whole of that great neighborhood became the scene of a fierce conflict in which both sides lost heavily. Right across Islington the street fighting spread, and many were the fatal traps set for the unwary German who found himself cut off in that maze of narrow streets between York Road and the Angel. The enemy, on the other hand, were shooting down women and girls as well as the men, even the non-combatants, those who came out of their homes to ascertain what was going on, being promptly fired at and killed. In the midst of all this, somebody ignited some petrol in a house a few doors from the chapel in Pentonville Road, and in a few moments the whole row of buildings were blazing furiously, belching forth black smoke and adding to the terror and confusion of those exciting moments. Even that large body of Germans now upon the scene were experiencing great difficulty in defending themselves. 
a perfect rain of bullets seemed directed upon them on every hand, and today's experience certainly proves that Londoners are patriotic and brave, and in their own districts they possess a superiority over the trained troops of the Kaiser. At length, after a most sanguinary struggle, the Londoners' position was carried, the houses were entered, and twenty-two brave patriots, mostly of the working class, taken prisoners. The populace, now realizing that the Germans had, after all, overpowered their comrades in their fortress, fell back. But, being pursued northward towards the railway line between Highbury and Barnesbury stations, many of them were dispatched on the spot. What followed was indeed terrible. The anger of the Germans now became uncontrollable. Having in view von Kronhelm's proclamation, which sentenced to death all who, not being in uniform, fired upon German troops, they decided to teach the unfortunate populace a lesson. As a matter of fact, they feared that such revolts might be repeated in other quarters. So they seized dozens of prisoners, men and women, and shot them down. Many of these summary executions took place against the wall of the St. Pancras station at the corner of Euston Road. Men and women were piteously sent to death. Wives, daughters, fathers, sons were ranged up against the wall, and, at signal from the colonel, fell forward with bullets through them. Of the men who so gallantly held the fortified house, not a single one escaped. Strings of men and women were hurried to their doom in one day, for the troops were savage with the lust of blood, and von Kronhelm, though he was aware of it by telephone, lifted not a finger to stop those arbitrary executions. But enough of such details. Suffice it to say that the stones of Islington were stained with the blood of innocent Londoners, and that those who survived took a fierce vow of vengeance. Von Kronhelm's legions had the upper hand for the moment, yet the conflict and its bloody sequel had the effect of arousing the fiercest anger within the heart of every Briton in the metropolis. What was in store for us none could tell. We were conquered, oppressed, starved yet hope was still within us. The League of Defenders were not idle, while South London was hourly completing her strength. It seems that after quelling the revolt at King's Cross, wholesale arrests were made in Islington. The guilt or innocence of the prisoners did not seem to matter, von Kronhelm dealing out to them summary punishment. Terror reigns in London. One newspaper correspondent, whose account is published this morning in South London, having been sent across the Thames by carrier pigeon, many of which were now being employed by the newspapers, had an opportunity of witnessing the wholesale executions which took place yesterday afternoon outside Dorchester House, where von Kleppen had established his quarters. Von Kleppen seems to be the most pitiless of the superior officers. The prisoners ranged up for inspection in front of the big mansion were mostly men from Islington, all of whom knew only too well the fate in store for them. Walking slowly along and eyeing the ranks of these unfortunate wretches, the German general stopped here and there, tapping a man on the shoulder or beckoning him out of the rear ranks. In most cases without further word, the individual thus selected was marched into the park at Stanhope Gate, where a small supplementary column was soon formed. League of Defenders, Daily Bulletin the League of Defenders of the British Empire publicly announced to Englishmen, although the north of London is held by the enemy, one, that England will soon entirely regain command of the sea, and that a rigorous blockade of the German ports will be established, two, that three of the vessels of the North German Lloyd Transatlantic Passenger Service have been captured, together with a number of minor German ships in the Channel and Mediterranean, three, that four German cruisers and two destroyers have fallen into the hands of the British. Four, that England's millions are ready to rise. Therefore, we are not yet beaten. Be prepared and wait. League of Defenders, Central Office, Bristol. Those chosen knew that their last hour had come. Some clasped their hands and fell upon their knees, imploring pity while others remained silent and stubborn patriots. One man, his face covered with blood and his arm broken, sat down and howled in anguish, and others wept in silence. 
Some women, wives and daughters of the condemned men, tried to get within the park to bid them adieu and to urge courage, but the soldiers beat them back with their rifles. Some of the men laughed defiantly. Others met death with a stony stare. The eyewitness saw the newly dug pit that served as common grave, and he stood by and saw them shot, and their corpses afterwards flung into it. One young fair-haired woman, condemned by von Kleppen, rushed forward to that officer, threw herself upon her knees imploring mercy, and protested her innocence wildly. But the officer, callous and pitiless, simply motioned to a couple of soldiers to take her within the park, where she shared the same fate as the men. How long will this awful state of affairs last? We must die or conquer. London is in the hands of a legion of assassins, Bavarians, Saxons, Württembergers, Hessians, Badeners, all now bent upon prolonging the reign of terror and thus preventing the uprising that they know is, sooner or later, inevitable. Terrible accounts are reaching us of how the Germans are treating their prisoners on Hounslow Heath, at Enfield, and other places, of the awful sufferings of the poor unfortunate fellows, of hunger, of thirst, and of inhuman disregard for either their comfort or their lives. At present we are powerless, hemmed in by our barricades. Behind us, upon Sydenham Hill, General Bamford is in a strong position, and his great batteries are already defending any attack upon London from the south. From the terrace in front of the Crystal Palace his guns can sweep the whole range of southern suburbs. Through Dulwich, Hearn Hill, Champion Hill, and Denmark Hill are riding British cavalry, all of whom show evident traces of the hard and fierce campaign. We see from Sydenham constant messages being heliographed, for General Bamford and Lord Byfield are in hourly communication by wireless telegraphy or by other means. What is transpiring at Windsor is not known, save that every night there are affairs of outposts with the Saxons, who on several occasions have attempted to cross the river by pontoons, and have on each occasion been driven back. It was reported to Parliament at its sitting in Bristol yesterday that the Cabinet had refused to entertain any idea of paying the indemnity demanded by Germany, and that their reply to von Kronhelm is one of open defiance. The brief summary of the speeches published shows that the government are hopeful, notwithstanding the present black outlook. They believe that when the hour comes for the revenge, London will rise as a man, and that socialist, nonconformist, labor agitators, anarchists, and demagogues will unite with us in one great national patriotic effort to exterminate our conquerors as we would exterminate vermin. Mr. Gerald Graham has made another great speech in the House, in which he reported the progress of the League of Defenders and its widespread ramifications. He told the government that there were over seven millions of able-bodied men in the country ready to revolt the instant the word went forth that there would be terrible bloodshed he warned them, but that the British would eventually prove the victors he was assured. He gave no details of the organization, for to a great measure it was a secret one, and von Kronhelm was already taking active steps to combat its intentions. But he declared that there was still a strong spirit of patriotism in the country, and explained how sturdy Scots were daily making their way south, and how men from Wales were already massing in Oxford. The speech was received on both sides of the house with ringing cheers when, in conclusion, he promised them that, within a few days, the fiat would go forth, and the enemy would find himself crushed and powerless. South London, he declared, is our stronghold, our fortress. Today it is impregnable, defended by a million British patriots, and I defy von Kronhelm, indeed, I dare him to attack it. Von Kronhelm was, of course, well aware of the formation of the defenders, but treated the League with contempt. If there was any attempt at a rising, he would shoot down the people like dogs. He declared this openly and publicly, and he also issued a warning to the English people in the German official gazette a daily periodical printed in one of the newspaper offices in Fleet Street in both German and English. The German commander fully believed that England was crushed, yet as the days went on 
he was puzzled that he received no response to his demand for indemnity. Twice he had sent special dispatch bearers to Bristol, but on both occasions the result was the same. Diplomatic representations had been made in Berlin through the Russian ambassador, who was now in charge of British interests in Germany, but all to no purpose. Our foreign minister simply acknowledged receipt of the various dispatches. On the continent the keenest interest was manifested at what was apparently a deadlock. The British had, it was known, regained command of the sea. Von Kronhelm's supplies were already cut off. The cables in direct communication between England and Germany had been severed, and the continental press, especially the Paris journals, gleefully recounted how two large Hamburg-American liners, attempting to reach Hamburg by passing north of Scotland, had been captured by British cruisers. Englishmen, your homes are desecrated, your children are starving, your loved ones are dead. Will you remain in cowardly inactivity? The German eagle flies over London, Hull, Newcastle, and Birmingham are in ruins. Manchester is a German city. Norfolk, Essex, and Suffolk form a German colony. The Kaiser's troops have brought death, ruin, and starvation upon you. Will you become Germans? No. Join the defenders and fight for England. You have England's millions beside you. Let us rise. Let us drive back the Kaiser's men. Let us shoot them at sight. Let us exterminate every single man who has desecrated English soil. Join the new League of Defenders. Fight for your homes. Fight for your wives. Fight for England. Fight for your king. The National League of Defenders head offices. Bristol, September 21st, 1910. In the Channel, too, a number of German vessels had been seized, and one that showed fight off the North Foreland was fired upon and sunk. The public at home, however, were more interested in supremacy on land. It was all very well to have command of the sea, they argued, but it did not appear to alleviate perceptibly the hunger and privations on land. The Germans occupied London, and while they did so all freedom in England was at an end. A great poster-headed Englishman, here reproduced, was seen everywhere. The whole country was flooded with it, and thousands upon thousands of heroic Britons, from the poorest to the wealthiest, clamored to enroll themselves. The movement was an absolutely national one in every sense of the word. The name of Gerald Graham, the new champion of England's power, was upon everyone's tongue. Daily he spoke in various towns in the west of England, in Plymouth, Taunton, Cardiff, Portsmouth, and Southampton, and assisted by the influential committee among whom were many brilliant speakers and men whose names were as household words, he aroused the country to the highest pitch of hatred against the enemy. The defenders, as they drilled in various centres through the whole of the west of England, were a strange and incongruous body. Grey-bearded army pensioners, ranged side by side with keen, enthusiastic youths, advised them and gave them the benefit of their expert knowledge. Volunteer officers in many cases assumed command, together with retired drill sergeants. The digging of trenches and the making of fortifications were assigned to navvies, bricklayers, plate layers, and agricultural laborers, large bodies of whom were under railway gangers and were ready to perform any excavation work. The Maxims and other machine guns were mostly manned by volunteer artillery, but instruction in the working of the Maxim was given to select classes in Plymouth, Bristol, Portsmouth, and Cardiff. Time was of utmost value, therefore the drilling was pushed forward day and night. It was known that von Kronhelm was already watchful of the movements of the League, and was aware daily of its growth. In London, with the greatest secrecy, the defenders were banding together. In face of the German proclamation posted upon the walls, Londoners were holding meetings in secret and enrolling themselves. Though the German eagle flew in Whitehall, and from the summit of St. Stephen's Tower, and though the heavy tramp of German sentries echoed in Trafalgar Square, in the quiet trafficless streets in the vicinity, England was not yet vanquished. The valiant men of London were still determined to sell their liberty dearly, and to lay down their lives for the freedom of their country and honor of their king. End of chapter 9 and book 2 Recording by Tom Weiss, 
Tom's Audiobooks dot com. Book three, chapter one of the invasion by William Le Q. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Weiss. Book three, the revenge, chapter one, a blow for freedom. Daily Telegraph Office, October one, two p.m. Three days have passed since the revolt at King's Cross, and each day, both on the Horse Guards Parade and in the park opposite Dorchester House, there have been summary executions. Von Kronhelm is in evident fear of the excited London populace and is endeavoring to cow them by his plain-spoken and threatening proclamations and by these wholesale executions of any person found with arms in his or her possession. But the word of command does not abolish the responsibility of conscience, and we are now awaiting breathlessly for the word to strike the blow in revenge. The other newspapers are reappearing, but all that is printed each morning is first subjected to a rigorous censorship, and nothing is allowed to be printed before it is passed and initialed by the two gold spectacle censors who sit and smoke their pipes in an office to themselves. Below we have German sentries on guard, for our journal is one of the official organs of von Kronhelm, and what now appears in it is surely sufficient to cause our blood to boil. Today there are everywhere signs of rapidly increasing unrest. Londoners are starving and are now refusing to remain patient any longer. The daily bulletin of the League of Defenders, though the posting of it is punishable by imprisonment, and it is everywhere torn down where discovered by the Germans, still gives daily brief news of what is in progress and still urges the people to wait in patience for the action of the government, as it is sarcastically put. Soon after eleven o'clock this morning, a sudden and clearly premeditated attack was made upon a body of the Bremen infantry who were passing along Oxford Street from Holborn to the Marble Arch. The soldiers were suddenly fired upon from windows of a row of shops between Newman Street and Rathbone Place, and before they could halt and return the fire, they found themselves surrounded by a great armed rabble who were emerging from all the streets leading into Oxford Street. While the Germans were maneuvering, some unknown hand launched from a window a bomb into the center of them. Next second there was a red flash, a loud report, and twenty-five of the enemy were blown to atoms. For a few moments the soldiers were demoralized, but orders were shouted loudly by their officers, and they began a most vigorous defense. In a few seconds the fight was as fierce as that at King's Cross, for out of every street in that working-class district lying between Tottenham Court Road and Great Portland Street on the north, and out of Soho on the south, poured thousands upon thousands of fierce Londoners, all bent upon doing their utmost to kill their oppressors. From almost every window along Oxford Street a rain of lead was now being poured upon the troops who vainly strove to keep their ground. Gradually, however, they were by slow degrees forced back into the narrow side turnings up Newman Street and Rathbone Place into Mortimer Street, Foley Street, Goode Street, and Charlotte Street, and there they were slaughtered almost to a man. Two officers were captured by the armed mob in Tottenham Street, and after being beaten, were stood up and shot in cold blood as vengeance for those shot during the past three days at von Kleppen's orders at Dorchester House. The fierce fight lasted quite an hour, and though reinforcements were sent for, yet, curiously, none arrived. The great mob, however, were well aware that very soon the iron hand of Germany would fall heavily upon them. Therefore, in frantic haste, they began soon after noon to build barricades and block up the narrow streets in every direction. At the end of Rathbone Place, Newman Street, Berners Street, Wells Street, and Great Tickfield Street, huge obstructions soon appeared, while on the east all by-streets leading into Tottenham Court Road were blocked up, and the same on the west in Great Portland Street, and on the north where the district was flanked by the Euston Road, so that by two o'clock the populous neighborhood bounded by the four great thoroughfares was rendered a fortress in itself. 
Within that area were thousands of armed men and women from Soho, Bloomsbury, Marleborn, and even Camden Town. There they remained in defiance of von Kronhelm's newest proclamation, which stared one in the face from every wall. Later, the enemy were unaware of the grave significance of the position of affairs, because Londoners betrayed no outward sign of the truth. Now, however, nearly every man and woman wore pinned upon their breasts a small piece of silk about two inches square, printed as a miniature Union Jack, the badge adopted by the League of Defenders. Though von Kronhelm was unaware of it, Lord Byfield, in council with Rhetorix and Bamford, had decided that in order to demoralize the enemy and give him plenty of work to do, a number of local uprisings should take place north of the Thames. These would occupy von Kronhelm, who would experience great difficulty in quelling them, and would no doubt eventually recall the Saxons from West Middlesex to assist. If the latter retired upon London, they would find the barricades held by Londoners in their rear, and Lord Byfield in their front, and be thus caught between two fires. In each district of London there was a chief of the defenders, and to each chief these orders had been conveyed in strictest confidence. Therefore, today, while the outbreak occurred in Oxford Street, there were fully a dozen others in various parts of the metropolis, each of a more or less serious character. Every district has already prepared its own secret defenses, its fortified houses, and its barricades and hidden byways. Besides the quantity of arms smuggled into London, every dead German has had his rifle, pistol, and ammunition stolen from him. Hundreds of the enemy have been surreptitiously killed for that very reason. Lawlessness is everywhere. Government and army have failed them, and Londoners are now taking the law into their own hands. In King Street, Hammersmith, in Nottingdale, in Forest Road, Dalston, in Wick Road, Hackney, in Commercial Road East, near Stepney Station, and in Prince of Wales Road, Kentish Town, the League of Defenders this morning, at about the same hour, first made their organization public by displaying our national emblem together with the white flags with the scarlet St. George's Cross, the ancient battle flag of England. For that reason, then, no reinforcements were sent to Oxford Street. Von Kronhelm was far too busy in other quarters. In Kentish Town, it is reported, the Germans gained a complete and decisive victory, for the people had not barricaded themselves strongly. Besides, there were large reinforcements of Germans ready in Regent's Park, and these came upon the scene before the defenders were sufficiently prepared. The flag was captured from the barricade in Prince of Wales Road, and the men of Kentish Town lost over four hundred killed and wounded. At Stepney, the result was the reverse. The enemy, believing it to be a mere local disturbance and easily quelled, sent but a small body of men to suppress it. But very quickly, in the intricate by-streets off Commercial Road, these were wiped out, not one single man surviving. A second and third body were sent, but so fiercely was the ground contested that they were at length compelled to fall back and leave the men of Stepney masters of their own district. In Hammersmith and in Nottingdale the enemy also lost heavily, though in Hackney they were successful after hard fighting. Everyone declares that this secret order issued by the League means that England is again prepared to give battle, and that London is commencing by her strategic movement of local rebellions. The gravity of the situation cannot now for one moment be concealed. London, north of the Thames, is destined to be the scene of the fiercest and most bloody warfare ever known in the history of the civilized world. The Germans will, of course, fight for their lives, while we shall fight for our homes and for our liberty. But right is on our side, and right will win. Reports from all over the metropolis tell the same tale. London is alert and impatient. At a word she will rise to a man and then woe betide the invader. Surely von Kronhelm's position is not a very enviable one. Our two censors in the office are smoking their pipes very gravely. Not a word of the street fighting is to be published. They will write their own account of it. 10 p.m. 
there has been a most frightful encounter at the Oxford Street and Tottenham Court Road barricades, a most stubborn resistance and gallant defense on the part of the men of Marleybone and Bloomsbury. From the lips of one of our correspondents who was within the barricade, I have just learned the details. It appears that just about four o'clock, General von Wilberg sent from the city a large force of the 19th Division under Lieutenant General Frankenfield, and part of these, advancing through the squares of Bloomsbury into Gower Street, attacked the defender's position from the Tottenham Court Road, while others coming up Holborn and New Oxford Street entered Soho from Charing Cross Road and threw up counter-barricades at the end of Dean Street, Warder Street, Berwick, Poland, Argyle, and the other streets, all of which were opposite the defences of the populace. In Great Portland Street, too, they adopted a similar line and without much ado the fight, commenced in a desultory fashion, soon became a battle. Within the barricades was a dense body of armed and angry citizens, each with his little badge, and every single one of them was ready to fight to the death. There is no false patriotism now, no mere bravado. Men make declarations and carry them out. The gallant Londoners, with their several maxims, wrought havoc among the invaders, especially in the Tottenham Court Road, where hundreds were maimed or killed. In Oxford Street the enemy, being under cover of their counter-barricades, little damage could be done on either side. The wide-open, deserted thoroughfare was every moment swept by a hail of bullets, but no one was injured. On the Great Portland Street side the populace made a feint of giving way at the Mortimer Street barricade, and a body of the enemy rushed in, taking the obstruction by storm. But next moment they regretted it, for they were set upon by a thousand armed men and wild-haired women, so that every man paid for his courage with his life. The women, seizing the weapons and ammunition of the dead Germans, now returned to the barricade to use them. The Mortimer Street defences were at once repaired, and it was resolved to relay the fatal trap at some other point. Indeed, it was repeated at the end of Percy Street, where about fifty more Germans, who thought themselves victorious, were set upon and exterminated. Until dusk the fight lasted. The Germans, finding their attack futile, began to hurl petrol bombs over the barricades, and these caused frightful destruction among our gallant men, several houses in the vicinity being set on fire. Fortunately there was still water in the street hydrants, and two fire-engines had already been brought within the beleaguered area in case of necessity. At last, about seven o'clock, the enemy, having lost very heavily in attempting to take the well-chosen position by storm, brought down several light field-guns from Regent's Park, and placing them at their counter-barricades, where, by the way, they had lost many men in the earlier part of the conflict while piling up their shelters, suddenly opened fire with shell at the huge obstructions before them. At first they made but little impression upon the flagstones, etc., of which the barricades were mainly composed. But before long their bombardment began to tell. For slowly, here and there, exploding shells made great breaches in the defenses that had been so heroically manned. More than once a high-explosive shell burst right among the crowd of riflemen behind a barricade sweeping dozens into eternity in a single instant. Against the fortifying houses each side of the barricades the German artillery trained their guns, and very quickly reduced many of those buildings to ruins. The air now became thick with dust and smoke, and mingled with the roar of artillery at such close quarters came the screams of the injured and the groans of the dying. The picture drawn by the eyewitness who described this was a truly appalling one. Gradually the Lunders were being overwhelmed, but they were selling their lives dearly, fully proving themselves worthy sons of grand old England. At last the fire from the Newman Street barricade of the defenders was silenced, and ten minutes later, a rush being made across from Dean Street, it was taken by storm. Then ensued fierce and bloody hand-to-hand -hand fighting right up to Cleveland Street, while almost at the same moment the enemy broke in from Great Portland Street. A scene followed that is impossible to describe. Through all those narrow crooked streets the fighting became general, and on either side hundreds fell. 
the defenders in places cornered the Germans, cut them off, and killed them. Though it was felt that now the barricades had been broken the day was lost, yet every man kept courage and fought with all his strength. For half an hour the Germans met with no success. On the contrary, they found themselves entrapped amid thousands of furious citizens, all wearing their silken badges, and all sworn to fight to the death. While the defenders still struggled on, loud and ringing cheers were suddenly raised from Tottenham Court Road. The people from Clerkenwell, joined by those in Bloomsbury, had arrived to assist them. They had risen and were attacking the Germans in the rear. Fighting was now general right across from Tottenham Court Road to Gray's Inn Road, and by nine o'clock, though von Vilberg sent reinforcements, a victory was gained by the defenders. Over two thousand Germans are lying dead and wounded about the streets and squares of Bloomsbury and Marylebone. The League had struck its first blow for freedom. What will the morrow bring us? Dire punishment or desperate victory? Daily Chronicle Office, October 4, 6 p.m. The final struggle for the possession of London is about to commence. Through all last night there were desultory conflicts between the soldiers and the people, in which many lives have, alas, been sacrificed. Von Vilberg still holds the city proper, with the mansion house as his headquarters. Within the area already shown upon the map there are no English, all the inhabitants having been long ago expelled. The great wealth of London is in German hands, it is true, but it is Dead Sea fruit they are unable either to make use of it or to deport it to Germany. Much has been taken away to the base at Southminster and other bases in Essex, but the greater part of the bullion still remains in the Bank of England. The most exciting stories have been reaching us during the last twenty-four hours, none of which, however, have passed the censor. For that reason I, one of the sub-editors, and keeping this diary as a brief record of events during the present dreadful times. After the terrific struggle at Marlebone three days ago, von Kronhelm saw plainly that if London were to rise in mass she would at once assume the upper hand. The German commander-in-chief had far too many points to guard. On the west of London he was threatened by Lord Byfield and host of auxiliaries, mostly sworn members of the National League of Defenders. On the south, across the river, Southwark, Lambeth, and Battersea formed an impregnable fortress containing over a million eager patriots ready to burst forth and sweep away the vain victorious army, while within central London itself the people were ready to rise. League of Defenders Citizens of London and loyal patriots, the hour has come to show your strength and to wreak your vengeance. Tonight, October 4 at 10 p.m. Rise and strike your blow for freedom. A million men are with Lord Byfield already within striking distance of London. A million follow them, and yet another million are ready in South London. Rise, fearless and stern. Let England for Englishmen be your battle cry, and avenge the blood of your wives and your children. Avenge this insult to your nation. Remember, ten o'clock tonight. Reports reaching us today from Lord Byfield's headquarters at Windsor are numerous but conflicting. As far as can be gathered, the authentic facts are as follows. Great bodies of the defenders, including many women all armed, are massing at Reading, Soning, Walkingham, and Maidenhead. Thousands have arrived and are hourly arriving by train from Portsmouth, Plymouth, Exeter, Bristol, Gloucester, and, in fact, all the chief centres of the west of England where Gerald Graham's campaign has been so marvellously successful. Sturdy Welsh colliers are marching shoulder to shoulder with agricultural labourers from Dorset and Devon, and clerks and citizens from the towns of Somerset, Cornwall, Gloucestershire, and Oxfordshire are taking arms beside the riffraff of their own neighbourhoods. Peer and peasant, professional man and pauper, all are now united with one common object to drive back the invader, and to save our dear old England. Oxford has, it seems, been one of the chief points of concentration, and the undergraduates who reassembled there to defend their colleges 
now form an advance guard of a huge body of defenders on the march by way of Henley and Maidenhead to follow in the rear of Lord Byfield. The latter holds Eton and the country across to High Wycombe while the Saxon headquarters are still at Staines. Frulich's cavalry division are holding the country across from Hinner through Stanmore and Chipping Barnet to the prison camp at Enfield Chase. These are the only German troops outside West London, the Saxons being now barred from entering by the huge barricades which the populace of West London have during the past few days been constructing. Every road leading into London from West Middlesex is now either strongly barricaded or entirely blocked up. Kew, Richmond, and Kingston bridges have been destroyed, and Lord Byfield, with General Bamford at the Crystal Palace, remains practically in possession of the whole of the south of the Thames. The conflict which is now about to begin will be one to the death. While, on the one hand, the Germans are bottled up among us, the fact must not be overlooked that their arms are superior, and that they are trained soldiers. Yet the two or three local risings of yesterday and the day previous have given us courage, for they show that the enemy cannot maneuver in the narrow streets and soon become demoralized. In London we fail because we have so few riflemen. If every man who now carries a gun could shoot, we could compel the Germans to fly a flag of truce within twenty-four hours. Indeed, if Lord Robert's scheme of universal training in 1906 had been adopted, the enemy would certainly never have been suffered to approach our capital. Alas, apathy has resulted in this terrible and crushing disaster, and we have only now to bear our part, each one of us, in the blow to avenge this desecration of our homes and the massacre of our loved ones. Today I have seen the white banners with the Red Cross, the ensign of the defenders everywhere. Till yesterday it was not openly displayed, but today it is actually hung from windows or flown defiantly from flagstaffs in full view of the Germans. In Kilburn, or, to be more exact, in the district lying between the Harrow Road and the High Road Kilburn, there was another conflict this morning between some of the German guard corps and the populace. The outbreak commenced by the arrest of some men who were found practicing with rifles in Paddington Recreation Ground. One man who resisted was shot on the spot, whereupon the crowd who assembled attacked the German picket and eventually killed them to a man. This was the signal for a general outbreak in the neighborhood, and half an hour later, when a force was sent to quell the revolt, fierce fighting became general all through the narrow streets of Kensal Green, especially at the big barricade that blocks the Harrow Road, where it is joined by Admiral Road. Here the bridges over the Grand Junction Canal have already been destroyed, for the barricades and defenses have been scientifically constructed under the instruction of military engineers. From an early hour today it has been apparent that all these risings were purposely ordered by the League of Defenders to cause von Kronhelm's confusion. Indeed, while the outbreak at Kensal Green was in progress, we had another reported from Dalston, a third from Limehouse, and a fourth from Homerton. Therefore it is quite certain that the various centres of the League are acting in unison upon secret orders from headquarters. Indeed, South London also took part in the fray this morning, for the defenders at the barricade at London Bridge have now mounted several field guns, and have started shelling von Vilberg's position in the city. It is said that the mansion house, where the general had usurped the apartments of the deported Lord Mayor, has already been half reduced to ruins. This action is, no doubt, only to harass the enemy, for surely General Bamford has no desire to destroy the city proper any more than it has already been destroyed. Lower Thames Street, King William Street, Gracechurch Street, and Cannon Street have, at any rate, been found untenable by the enemy, upon whom some losses have been inflicted. South London is every moment anxious to know the truth. Two days after the bombardment we succeeded at night in sinking a light telegraph cable in the river across from the embankment at the bottom of Temple Avenue, and are in communication with our temporary office in Southwark Street. An hour ago there came, through secret sources, information of another naval victory to our credit, several German warships being sunk and captured. Here we dare not print it, 
so I have just wired it across to the other side where they are issuing a special edition. Almost simultaneously with the report of the British victory, namely at five o'clock, the truth, the great and all-important truth, became revealed. The mandate has gone forth from the headquarters of the League of Defenders that London is to rise in her might at ten o'clock tonight, and that a million men are ready to assist us. Placards and bills on red paper are everywhere. Frantic efforts are being made by the Germans all over London to suppress both posters and handbills. It is now six o'clock. In four hours it is believed that London will be one huge seething conflict. Night has been chosen, I suppose, in order to give the populace the advantage. The by streets are for the most part still unlit, save for oil lamps, for neither gas nor electric light are yet in proper working order after the terrible dislocation of everything. The scene of the defenders is, as already proved, to lure the Germans into the narrower thoroughfares and then exterminate them. Surely in the history of the world there has never been such a bitter vengeance as that which is now inevitable. London, the greatest city ever known, is about to rise. Midnight. London has risen. How can I describe the awful scenes of panic, bloodshed, patriotism, brutality, and vengeance that are at this moment in progress? As I write, through the open window I can hear the roar of voices, the continual crackling of rifles, and the heavy booming of guns. I walked along Fleet Street at nine o'clock, and I found, utterly disregarding the order that no unauthorized persons are to be abroad after nightfall, hundreds upon hundreds of all classes, all wearing their little silk Union Jack badges pinned to their coats, on the way to join in their particular districts. Some carried rifles, other revolvers, while others were unarmed. Yet not a German did I see in the streets. It seems as though for the moment the enemy had vanished. There was only the strong cordon across the bottom of Ludgate Hill, men who looked on in wonder, but without bestirring themselves. Is it possible that von Kronhelm's strategy is to remain inactive and refuse to fight? The first shot I heard fired, just after ten o'clock, was at the strand end of Fleet Street at the corner of Chancery Lane. There I afterwards discovered a party of forty German infantrymen had been attacked and all of them killed. Quickly following this I heard the distant booming of artillery and then the rattle of musketry and pom-poms became general, but not in the neighborhood where I was. For nearly half an hour I remained at the corner of Aldwych, then on going farther along the Strand I found that the defenders from the Waterloo Road had made a wild sortie into the Strand, but could find no Germans there. The men who had for a fortnight held that barricade at the bridge were more like demons than human beings. Therefore I retired, and in the crush made my way back to the office to await reports. They were not long in arriving. I can only give a very brief resume at the moment, for they are so numerous as to be bewildering. Speaking generally, the whole of London has obeyed the mandate of the League, and rising or attacking the Germans at every point. In the majority of cases, however, the enemy holds strong positions and are defending themselves inflicting terrible losses upon the unorganized populace. Every Londoner is fighting for himself without regard for orders or consequences. In Bethnal Green the Germans, lured into the maze of by-streets, have suffered great losses and again in Clerkenwell, St. Luke's, Kingsland, Hackney, and Old Ford. Whitechapel, too, devoid of its alien population, who have escaped into Essex, has held its own and the enemy have had some great losses in the streets off Cable and Lehman Streets. With the exception of the sortie across Waterloo Bridge, South London is, as yet, remaining in patience acting under the orders of General Bamford. News has come in ten minutes ago of a fierce and sudden attack upon the Saxons by Lord Byfield from Windsor, but there are, as yet, no details. From the office across the river, I am being constantly asked for details of the fight and how it is progressing. In Southwark the excitement is evidently most intense, and it requires all the energy of the local commanders of the defenders to repress another sortie across that bridge. 
there has just occurred an explosion so terrific that the whole of this building has been shaken as though by an earthquake. London has struck her first blow of revenge. What will be its sequel? End of chapter one. Recording by Tom Weiss, Tom's Audiobooks dot com. Chapter Two of the Invasion by William LeCue. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Weiss. Chapter Two. Scenes at Waterloo Bridge. The following is the personal narrative of a young chauffeur named John Burgess who assisted in the defense of the barricade at Waterloo Bridge. The statement was made to a reporter at noon on October 5 while he was lying on a mattress in the church of St. Martin's in the fields, so badly wounded in the chest that the surgeons had given him up. He related his story in the form of a farewell letter to his sister. The reporter chanced to be passing, and, hearing him asking for someone to write for him, volunteered to do so. We all did our best, he said, every one of us. Myself, I was at the barricade for thirteen days, thirteen days of semi-starvation, sleeplessness, and constant tension, for we knew not, from one moment to another, when a sudden attack might be made upon us. At first our obstruction was a mere ill-built pile of miscellaneous articles, half of which would not stop bullets. But on the third day our men, superintended by several non-commissioned officers in uniform, began to put the position in a proper state of defense, to mount maxims in the neighboring houses, and to place explosives in the crown of two of the neighboring houses, and to place explosives in the crown of two of the arches of the bridge, so that we could instantly demolish it if necessity arose. Fully a thousand men were holding the position, but unfortunately few of them had ever handled a rifle. As regards myself, I had learned to shoot rocks when a boy in Shropshire, and now that I had obtained a gun I was anxious to try my skill. When the League of Defenders was started and a local secretary came to us we all eagerly joined, each receiving, after he had taken his oath and signed his name, a small silk Union Jack, the badge of the League not to be worn till the word went forth to rise. There came a period, long, dreary, shadeless days of waiting, when the sun beat down upon us mercilessly, and our vigilance was required to be constant both day and night. So uncertain were the movements of the enemy opposite us that we scarcely dared to leave our positions for a moment. Night after night I spent sleeping in a neighboring doorway with an occasional stretch upon somebody's bed in some house in the vicinity. Now and then, whenever we saw Germans moving in Wellington Street, we sent a volley into them, in return receiving a sharp reply from their pom-poms. Constantly our sentries were on the alert along the wharves and in the riverside warehouses, watching for the approach of the enemy's spies and boats. Almost nightly some adventurous spirits among the Germans would try and cross. On one occasion, while doing sentry duty in a warehouse backing on Commercial Road, I was sitting with a comrade at a window overlooking the river. The moon was shining, for the night was a balmy and beautiful one, and all was quiet. It was about two o'clock in the morning, and as we sat smoking our pipes, with our eyes fixed upon the glittering water, we suddenly saw a small boat containing three men stealing slowly along in the shadow. For a moment the rowers rested upon their oars, as if undecided, then pulled forward again in search of a landing place. As they passed below our window I shouted out a challenge. At first there was no response. Again I repeated it when I heard a muttered imprecation in German. "'Spies!' I cried to my comrade, and with one accord we raised our rifles and fired. Ere the echo of the first shot had died away I saw one man fall into the water while at the next shot a second man half rose from his seat, threw up his hands, and staggered back wounded. The firing gave the alarm at the barricade, and ere the boat could approach the bridge, though the survivor pulled for dear life, a maxim spat forth its red fire, and both boat and oarsmen were literally riddled. Almost every night similar incidents were reported. 
the enemy were doing all in their power to learn the exact strength of our defenses, but I do not think their efforts were very successful. The surface of the river, every inch of it, was under the careful scrutiny of a thousand watchful eyes. Each day the bulletin of our National Association brought us tidings of what was happening outside. At last, however, the welcome word came to us on the morning of October 4, that at ten that night we were to make a concerted attack upon the Germans. A scarlet bill was thrust into my hand, and as soon as the report was known we were all highly excited and through the day prepared ourselves for the struggle. A gun sounded from the direction of Westminster. We looked at our watches and found it was ten o'clock. Our bugles sounded and we sprang to our positions as we had done dozens, nay, hundreds of times before. I felt faint, for I had only had half a pint of weak soup all day, for the bread did not go round. Nevertheless, the knowledge that we were about to strike the blow inspired me with fresh life and strength. Our officer shouted a brief word of command, and next moment we opened a withering fire upon the enemy's barricade in Wellington Street. In a moment a hundred rifles and several maxims spat their red fire at us, but as usual the bullets flattened themselves harmlessly before us. Then the battery of artillery which Sir Francis Bamford had sent us three days before got into position, and in a few moments began hurling great shells upon the German defenses. Behind us was a great armed multitude ready and eager to get at the foe a huge unorganized body of fierce irate Londoners determined upon having blood for blood. From over the river the sound of battle was rising, a great roaring like the sound of a distant sea, with ever and anon the crackling of rifles and the boom of guns, while above the night sky grew a dark blood-red with the glare of a distant conflagration. For half an hour we pounded away at the barricade in Wellington Street with our siege guns, maxims, and rifles, until a well-directed shell exploded beneath the center of the obstruction, blowing open a great gap and sending fragments high into the air. Then it seemed that all resistance suddenly ceased. At first we were surprised at this, but on further scrutiny we found that it was not our fire that had routed the enemy, but that they were being attacked in their rear by hosts of armed citizens surging down from Kingsway and the Strand. We could plainly discern that the Germans were fighting for their lives. Into the midst of them we sent one or two shells, but fearing to cause casualties among our own comrades we were compelled to cease firing. The armed crowd behind us, finding that we were again inactive, at once demanded that our barricade should be opened so that they might cross the bridge and assist their comrades by taking the Germans in the rear. For ten minutes our officer in charge refused, for the order of General Gatoritz, commander-in-chief of the League, was that no sortie was to be made at present. However, the South Londoners became so infuriated that our commander was absolutely forced to give way, though he knew not into what trap we might fall, as he had no idea of the strength of the enemy in the neighborhood of the Strand. A way was quickly opened in the obstruction, and two minutes later we were pouring across Waterloo Bridge in thousands, shouting and yelling in triumph as we passed the ruins of the enemy's barricade, and fell upon him with merciless revenge. With us were many women who were, perhaps, fiercer and more unrelenting than the men. Indeed, many a woman that night killed a German with her own hands, firing revolvers in their faces, striking with knives, and even blinding them with vitriol. The scene was both exciting and ghastly. At the spot where I first fought, on the pavement outside the Savoy, we simply slaughtered the Germans in cold blood. Men cried for mercy, but we gave them no quarter. London had risen in its might, and as our comrades fought all along the Strand and around Alwich, we gradually exterminated every man in German uniform. Soon the roadways of the Strand, Wellington Street, Aldwych, Burley Street, Southampton Street, Bedford Street, and right along to Trafalgar Square were covered with dead and dying. The wounded of both nationalities were trodden underfoot and killed by the swaying, struggling thousands. The enemy's loss must have been severe in our particular quarter, for of the great body of men from Hamburg and Lübeck holding their end of Waterloo Bridge, I do not believe a single one was spared, even though they fought for their lives like veritable devils. Our success intoxicated us, I think. 
that we were victorious at that point cannot be doubted, but with foolish disregard for our own safety we pressed forward into Trafalgar Square in the belief that our comrades were similarly making an attack upon the enemy there. The error was, alas, a fatal one for many of us. To fight an organized force in narrow streets is one thing, but to meet him in a large open space with many inlets, like Trafalgar Square, is another. The enemy were no doubt awaiting us, for as we poured out from the strand at Charing Cross we were met with a devastating fire from German maxims on the opposite side of the square. They were holding Whitehall to protect von Kronhelm's headquarters, the entrances to Spring Gardens, Cockspur Street, and Pall Mall East, and their fire was converged upon the great armed multitude which, being pressed on from behind, came out into the open square only to fall in heaps beneath the sweeping hail of German lead. The error was one that could not be rectified. We all saw it when too late. There was no turning back now. I struggled to get into the small side street that runs down by the bar of the Grand Hotel, but it was blocked with people already in refuge there. Another instant and I was lifted from my legs by the great throng going to their doom and carried right in the forefront to the square. Women screamed when they found themselves facing the enemy's fire. The scene was awful, a massacre, nothing more or less. For every German's life we had taken, a dozen of our own were now being sacrificed. A woman was pushed close to me, her gray hair streaming down her back, her eyes starting wildly from her head, her bony hands smeared with blood. Suddenly she realized that right before her red fire was spitting from the German guns. Screaming in despair, she clung frantically to me. I felt next second a sharp burning pain in my chest we fell forward together upon the bodies of our comrades. When I came to myself, I found myself here in this church, close to where I fell. On that same night desperate sorties were made from the London, Southwark, and Blackfriars bridges, and terrible havoc was committed by the defenders. The German losses were enormous, for the South Londoners fought like demons and gave no quarter. End of chapter 2 Recording by Tom Weiss, Tom's Audiobooks dot com. Chapter Three of the Invasion by William Lequeu. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Weiss. Chapter Three, Great British Victory. The following dispatch from the war correspondent of the Times with Lord Byfield was received on the morning of October 5, but was not published in that journal till some days later, owing to the German censorship which necessitated its being kept secret. Will is then, October 4, evening. After a bloody but successful combat lasting from early dawn till late in the afternoon, the country to the immediate west of the metropolis had been swept clear of the hated invaders, and the masses of the League of Defenders can be poured into the west of London without let or hindrance. In the desperate street fighting which is now going on, they will be much more formidable than they were ever likely to be in the open field where they were absolutely incapable of maneuvering. As for the Saxons, what is left of them, and Frolich's cavalry division, with whom we have been engaged all day, they have now fallen back on Harrow and Hendon, it is said. But it is currently reported that a constant movement towards the high ground near Hampstead is going on. These rumors come by way of London, since the enemy's enormous force of cavalry is still strong enough to prevent us getting any first-hand intelligence of his movements. As has been previously reported, the Twelfth Saxon Corps, under the command of Prince Henry of Württemberg, had taken up a position intended to cover the metropolis from the hordes of defenders which, supported by a small leaven of regulars, with a proportion of cavalry and guns, were known to be slowly rolling up from the west and south. Their front, facing west, extended from Staines on the south to Pinner on the north, passing through Stanwell, West Drayton, and Uxbridge. In addition they had a strong reserve in the neighborhood of Hounslow, whose business it was to cover their left flank by keeping watch along the line of the Thames. They had destroyed all bridges over the river between Staines and Hammersmith. Hutney Bridge, however, was still intact, 
as all attacks on it had been repulsed by the British holding it on the south side. Such was the general state of affairs when Lord Byfield, who had established his headquarters at Windsor, formed his plan of attack. As far as I have been able to ascertain, its general idea was to hold the Saxons to the position by the threat of three hundred thousand defenders that were assembled and were continually increasing along a roughly parallel line to that occupied by the enemy, at about ten miles at distance from it, while he attacked their left flank with what regular and militia regiments he could rapidly get together near Esher and Kingston. By this time the southern lines in the neighborhood of London were all in working order, the damage that had been done here and there by small parties of the enemy who had made raids across the river having been repaired. It was, therefore, not a very difficult matter to assemble troops from Windsor and various points on the south of London at very short notice. General Bamford, to whom had been entrusted the defense of South London, and who had established his headquarters at the Crystal Palace, also contributed every man he could spare from the remnant of the regular troops under his command. It was considered quite safe now that the Germans in the city were so hardly pressed to leave the defense of the Thames Bridge to the masses of irregulars who had all along formed the bulk of their defenders. The risk that Prince Henry of Württemberg would take the bull by the horns and by a sudden forward move attack and scatter the inert and invertebrate mass of defenders who were in his immediate front had, of course, to be taken. But it was considered that, in the present state of affairs in London, he would hardly dare to increase the distance between the Saxon corps and the rest of the German army. Events proved the correctness of this surmise, but, owing to unforeseen circumstances, the course of the battle was somewhat different from that which had been anticipated. Despite the vigilance of the German spies, our plans were kept secret till the very end, and it is believed that the great convergence of regular troops that began as soon as it was dark from Windsor and from along the line occupied by the Army of the League on the west, right round to Greenwich on the east, went on without any news of the movement being carried to the enemy. Before dawn this morning every unit was in the position to which it had been previously detailed, and everything was in readiness. The Royal Engineers began to throw a pontoon bridge over the Thames at the point where it makes a bend to the south, just above the site of Walton Bridge. The enemy's patrols and pickets in the immediate neighborhood at once opened a heavy fire on the workers, but it was beaten down by that which was poured upon them from the houses in Walton-on-Thames which had been quietly occupied during the night. The enemy in vain tried to reinforce them, but in order to do this their troops had to advance into a narrow peninsula which was swept by a cross-fire of shells from batteries which had been placed in position on the south side of the river for this very purpose. By seven o'clock the bridge was completed, and the troops were beginning to cross over covered by the fire of the artillery and by an advance guard which had been pushed over in boats. Simultaneously very much the same thing had been going on at Long Ditton, and fierce fighting was going on in the avenues and gardens round Hampton Court. Success here, too, attended the British arms. As a matter of fact, a determined attempt to cross the river in force had not at all been anticipated by the Germans. They had not credited their opponents with the power of so rapidly assembling an army and assuming an effective and vigorous offensive so soon after their terrible series of disasters. What they had probably looked for was an attempt to overwhelm them by sheer force of numbers. They doubtless calculated that Lord Byfield would stiffen his flabby masses of defenders with what trained troops he could muster, and endeavor to attack their lines along their whole length, overlapping them on the flank. They realized that to do this he would have to sacrifice his men in thousands upon thousands, but they knew that to do so would be his only possible chance of success in this eventuality, since the bulk of his men could neither maneuver nor deploy. Still they reckoned that in the desperate situation of the British he would make up his mind to do this. On their part, although they fully realized the possibility of being overwhelmed by such tactics, they felt pretty confident that, posted as they were behind a perfect network of small rivers and streams which ran down to join the Thames, they would at least succeed in beating off the attack with heavy loss, 
and stood no bad chance of turning the repulse into a rout by skillful use of Furlick's cavalry division, which would be irresistible when attacking totally untrained troops after they had been shattered and disorganized by artillery fire. This, at least, is the view of those experts with whom I have spoken. What, perhaps, tended rather to confirm them in their theories as to the action of the British was the rifle-firing that went on along the whole of their front all night through. The officers in charge of the various units which conglomerated together formed the forces facing the Saxons had picked out the few men under their command who really had some little idea of using a rifle, and, supplied with plenty of ammunition, had sent them forward in numerous small parties with general orders to approach as near the enemy's picket line as possible, and as soon as fired on, to lie down and open fire in return. So a species of sniping engagement went on from dark to dawn. Several parties got captured or cut up by the German outlying troops, and many others got shot by neighboring parties of snipers. But although they did not in all probability do the enemy much damage, yet they kept them on the alert all night and led them to expect an attack in the morning. One way and another, luck was entirely on the side of the patriots that morning. When daylight came, the British massed to the westward of Staines and had such a threatening appearance from their intense numbers and their fire from the batteries of heavy guns and howitzers on the south side of the river, which took the German left flank in, was so heavy that Prince Henry, who was there in person, judged an attack to be imminent, and would not spare a man to reinforce his troops at Shepperton and Halliford, who were numerically totally inadequate to resist the advance of the British once they got across the river. He turned a deaf ear to the most imploring requests for assistance, but ordered the officer in command at Hounslow to move down at once and drive the British into the river. So it has been reported by our prisoners. Unluckily for him, this officer had his hands quite full enough at this time, for the British who had crossed at Long Ditton had now made themselves masters of everything east of the Thames Valley branch of the London and Southwestern Railway, were being continually reinforced, and were fast pushing their right along the western bank of the river. Their left was reported to be in Kempton Park, where they joined hands with those who had effected a crossing near Walton-on-Thames. More bridges were being built at Platts Eyot, Tags Eyot, and Sunbury Lock, while boats and wherries and shoals appeared from all creeks and backwaters and hiding places as soon as both banks were in the hands of the British. Regulars, militia, and lastly volunteers were now pouring across in thousands. Forward was still the word. About noon a strong force of Saxons was reported to be retreating along the road from Staines to Brentford. They had guns with them which engaged the field batteries which were at once pushed forward by the British to attack them. These troops, eventually joining hands with those at Hounslow, opposed a more determined resistance to our advance than we had hitherto encountered. According to what we learned subsequently from prisoners and others, they were commanded by Prince Henry of Württemberg in person. He had quitted his position at Staines, leaving only a single battalion and a few guns as a rear guard to oppose the masses of the defenders who threatened him in that direction, and had placed his troops in the best position he could to cover the retreat of the rest of his corps from the line they had been occupying. He had, it would appear, soon after the fighting began, received the most urgent orders from von Kronhelm to fall back on London and assist him in the street fighting that had now been going on without intermission for the best part of two days. Von Kronhelm probably thought that he would be able to draw off some of his numerous foes to the westward, but the message was received too late. Prince Henry did his best to obey it, but by this time the very existence of the Twelfth Corps was at stake on account of the totally unexpected attack on his left rear by the British regular troops. He opposed such a stout resistance with the troops under his immediate command that he brought the British advance to a temporary standstill, while in his rear every road leading Londonward was crowded with the rest of his army as they fell back from West Drayton, Uxbridge, Ryslip, and Pinner. Had they been facing trained soldiers they would have found it most difficult, if not impossible, to do this, but as it was the undisciplined and untrained masses of the League of Defenders lost a long time in advancing, 
and still longer in getting over a series of streams and dikes that lay between them and the abandoned Saxon position. They lost heavily, too, from the fire of the small rear guards that had been left at the most likely crossing places. The Saxons were therefore able to get quite well away from them, and when some attempt was being made to form up the thousands of men who presently found themselves congregated on the heath east of Uxbridge before advancing further, a whole brigade of Frulich's heavy cavalry suddenly swept down upon them from behind Ickham village. The debacle that followed was frightful. The unwieldy mass of leaguers swayed this way and that for a moment in the panic occasioned by the sudden apparition of the serried masses of charging cavalry that were rushing down on them with a thunder of hooves that shook the earth. A few scattered shots were fired, without any perceptible effect, and before they could either form up or fly the German riders were upon them. It was a perfect massacre. The leaguers could oppose no resistance whatever. They were ridden down and slaughtered with no more difficulty than if they had been a flock of sheep. Swinging their long straight swords, the cavalrymen cut them down at hundreds and drove thousands into the river. The defenders were absolutely pulverized and fled westwards in a huge scattered crowd. But if the Germans had the satisfaction of scoring a local victory in this quarter, things were by no means rosy for them elsewhere. Prince Henry, by desperate efforts, contrived to hold on long enough in his covering position to enable the Saxons from the central portion of his abandoned line to pass through Hounslow and move along the London road through Brentford. Here disaster befell them. A battery of 4.7 guns was suddenly unmasked on Richmond Hill, and, firing at a range of 5,000 yards, played havoc with the marching column. The head of it also suffered severe loss from riflemen concealed in Kew Gardens, and the whole force had to extend and fall back for some distance in a northerly direction. Near Ealing they met the Uxbridge Brigade, and a certain delay and confusion occurred. However, trained soldiers such as these are not difficult to reorganize, and while the latter continued its march along the main road the remainder moved in several small parallel columns through Acton and Turnham Green. Before another half-hour had elapsed there came a sound of firing from the advance guard. Orders to halt followed, then orders to send forward reinforcements. During all this time the rattle of rifle fire waxed heavier and heavier. It soon became apparent that every road and street leading into London was barricaded, and that the houses on either side were crammed with riflemen. Before any set plan of action could be determined on, the retiring Saxons found themselves committed to a very nasty bout of street fighting. Their guns were almost useless, since they could not be placed in positions from which they could fire on the barricades except so close as to be under effective rifle fire. They made several desperate attempts, most of which were repulsed. In Goldhawk Road a Jaeger battalion contrived to rush a big rampart of paving stones which had been improvised by the British, but, once over, they were decimated by the fire from the houses on either side of the street. Big high explosive shells from Richmond Hill, too, began to drop among the Saxons. Though the range was long, the gunners were evidently well informed of the whereabouts of the Saxon troops, and made wonderfully lucky shooting. For some time the distant rumble of the firing to the southwest had been growing more distinct in their ears, and about four o'clock it suddenly broke out comparatively nearby. Then came an order from Prince Henry to fall back on Ealing at once. What had happened? It will not take long to relate this. Prince Henry's covering position had lain roughly between East Benfont and Hounslow, facing southeast. He had contrived to hold on to the latter place long enough to allow his right to pivot on it and fall back to Cranford Bridge. Here they were, to a certain extent, relieved from the close pressure they had been subjected to by the constantly advancing British troops, by the able and determined action of Furlick's cavalry brigade. But in the meantime, his enemies on the left, constantly reinforced from across the river, while never desisting from their so far unsuccessful attack on Hounslow, worked round through Twickenham and Islesworth till they began to menace his rear. He must abandon Hounslow or be cut off. With consummate generalship 
he withdrew his left along the line of the Metropolitan and District Railway, and sent word to the troops on his right to retire and take up a second position at Southall Green. Unluckily for him, there was a delay in transmission, resulting in a considerable number of these troops being cut off and captured. Frulich's cavalry were unable to aid them at this juncture, having their attention drawn away by the masses of leaguers who had managed to get over the column and were congregating near Harmonsworth. They cut these up and dispersed them, but afterwards found that they were separated from the Saxons by a strong force of British regular troops who occupied Harlington and opened a fire on the riders that emptied numerous saddles. They therefore made off to the northward. From this forward nothing could check the steady advance of the English, though fierce fighting went on till dark all through Hanwell, Ealing, Herivale, and Wembley, the Saxons struggling gamely to the last, but getting more and more disorganized. Had it not been for Froelich's division on their right, they would have been surrounded. As it was, they must have lost half their strength in casualties and prisoners. At dark, however, Lord Byfield ordered a general halt of his tired though triumphant troops, and bivouacked and billeted them along a line reaching from Willesden on the right through Wembley to Greenford. He had established his headquarters at Wembley. I have heard some critics say that he ought to have pushed on his freshest troops toward Hendon to prevent the remnants of our opponents from re-entering London. But others, with reason, urge that he is right to let them into the metropolis, which they will now find to be merely a trap. Extracts from the Diary of General von Kleppen commander of the 4th German Army Corps, occupying London. Dorchester House, Park Lane, October 6. We are completely deceived. Our position, much as we are attempting to conceal it, is a very grave one. We believe that if we reached London the British spirit would be broken. Yet the more drastic our rule, the fiercer becomes the opposition. How it will end I fear to contemplate. The British are dull and apathetic, but, once roused, they fight like fiends. Last night we had an example of it. This League of Defenders, which von Kronhelm has always treated with ridicule, is, we have discovered, too late, practically the whole of England. Von Bistrom, commanding the Seventh Corps, and von Hazlin, of the Eighth Corps, have constantly been reporting its spread through Manchester, Leeds, Bradford, Sheffield, Birmingham, and the other great towns we now occupy. But our commander-in-chief has treated the matter lightly, declaring it to be a kind of offshoot of some organization they have in England, called the Primrose League. Yesterday, at the Council of War, however, he was compelled to acknowledge his error when I handed him a scarlet handbill calling upon the British to make a concerted attack upon us at ten o'clock. Fortunately, we were prepared for the assault, otherwise I verily believe that the honors would have rested upon the populace in London. As it is, we suffered considerable reverses in various districts, where our men were lured into the narrow side streets and cut up. I confess I am greatly surprised at the valiant stand made everywhere by the Londoners. Last night they fought to the very end. A disaster to our arms in the Strand was followed by a victory in Trafalgar Square, where von Wilberg had established defences for the purpose of preventing the joining of the people of the East End with those of the West. End of chapter 3 Recording by Tom Weiss Tom's Audiobooks dot com Chapter 4 of The Invasion by William LeCue This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Weiss Chapter 4 Massacre of Germans in London Daily Telegraph Office, October 12, 6 p.m. Through the whole of last week the Germans occupying London suffered great losses. They are now hemmed in on every side. At three o'clock this morning von Kronhelm, having withdrawn the greater part of the troops from the defense of the bridges, in an attempt to occupy defensive positions in North London, the South Londoners, impatient with long waiting, broke forth and came across the river in enormous multitudes, every man bent upon killing a German wherever seen. The night air was rent everywhere by the hoarse exultant shouts as London, 
the giant all-powerful city, fell upon the audacious invader. Through our office windows came the dull roar of London's millions swelled by the defenders from the west and south of England, and by the gallant men from Canada, India, the Cape, and other British colonies who had come forward to fight for the mother country as soon as her position was known to be critical. In the streets are to be seen colonial uniforms side by side with a costermonger from Whitechapel or Walworth, and dark-faced Indians and turbans are fighting out in Fleet Street and the Strand. In the great struggle now taking place, many of our reporters and correspondents have unfortunately been wounded, and alas, four of them killed. In these terrible days a man's life is not safe from one moment to another both sides seem to have now lost their heads completely. Among the Germans all semblance of order has apparently been thrown to the winds. It is known that London has risen to a man, and the enemy are therefore fully aware of their imminent peril. Already they are beaten. True, von Kronhelm still sits in the war office directing operations, operations he knows too well are foredoomed to failure. The Germans have, it must be admitted, carried on the war in a chivalrous spirit until those drastic executions exasperated the people. Then neither side gave quarter, and now today, all through Islington, Hoxton, Kingsland, and Dalston, right out eastwards to Homerton, a perfect massacre of Germans is in progress. Lord Byfield has issued two urgent proclamations, threatening the people of London with all sorts of penalties if they kill instead of taking an enemy prisoner, but they seem to have no effect. London is starved in anger to such a pitch that her hatred knows no bounds, and only blood will atone for the wholesale slaughter of the innocent since the bombardment of the metropolis began. The Kaiser has, we hear, left the Belvedere at Scarborough, where he has been living incognito. A confidential report, apparently well-founded, has reached us that he embarked upon the steam trawler Morning Star at Scarborough yesterday and set out across the Dogger with Germany, of course, as his destination. Surely he must now regret his ill-advised policy of making an attack upon England. He had gauged our military weakness very accurately, but he had not counted upon the patriotic spirit of our empire. It may be that he has already given orders to von Kronhelm but it is nevertheless a very significant fact that the German wireless telegraph apparatus on the summit of Big Ben is in constant use by the German commander-in-chief. He is probably in hourly communication with Bremen, or with the Emperor himself upon the trawler Morning Star. Near Highbury Fields about noon today some British cavalry surprised a party of Germans and attempted to take them prisoners. The latter showed fight, whereupon they were shot down to a man. The British held as prisoners by the Germans near Enfield have now been released and are rejoining their comrades along the northern heights. Many believe that another and final battle will be fought north of London, but military men declare that the German power is already broken. Whether von Kronhelm will still continue to lose his men at the rate he is now doing, or whether he will sue for peace, is an open question. Personally, he was against the bombardment of London from the very first, yet he was compelled to carry out the orders of his imperial master. The invasion, the landing, and the successes in the north were, in his opinion, quite sufficient to have paralyzed British trade and caused such panic that an indemnity would have been paid. To attack London was, in his opinion, a proceeding far too dangerous, and his estimate is now proved to have been the correct one. Now that they have lost command of the sea and are cut off from their bases in Essex, the enemy's situation is hopeless. They may struggle on, but assuredly the end can only be an ignominious one. Yet the German eagle still flies proudly over the war office, over St. Stephen's, and upon many other public buildings, while upon others British royal standards and Union jacks are commencing to appear each one being cheered by the excited Londoners, whose hearts are now full of hope. Germany shall be made to bite the dust. That is the war cry everywhere. 
many a proud Uhlan and Cruzier has to-day ridden to his death amid the dense mobs, mad with the lust of blood. Some of the more unfortunate of the enemy have been lynched and torn limb from limb, while others have died deaths too horrible to hear describe in detail. Each hour brings to us further news showing how, by slow degrees, the German army of occupation is being wiped out. People are jeering at the audacious claim for indemnity presented to the British government when the enemy entered London, and are asking whether we will not present a claim to Germany. Von Kronhelm is not blamed so much as his emperor. He has been the cat's paw, and has burned his fingers in endeavouring to snatch the chestnuts from the fire. As a commander, he has acted justly, fully observing the international laws concerning war. It was only when faced by the problem of a national uprising that he countenanced anything bordering upon capital punishment. An hour ago our censors were withdrawn. They came and shook hands with many members of the staff, and retired. This surely is a significant fact that von Kromhelm hopes to regain the confidence of London by appearing to treat her with a fatherly solicitude, or is it that he intends to sue for peace at any price? An hour ago another desperate attempt was made on the part of the men of South London, aided by a large body of British regulars, to regain possession of the war office. Whitehall was once more the scene of a bloody fight, but so strongly does von Kronhelm hold the place and all the adjacent thoroughfares, he apparently regarding it as his own fortress, that the attack was repulsed with heavy loss on our side. All the bridges are now open. The barricades are in most cases being blown up, and people are passing and repassing freely for the first time since the day following the memorable bombardment. London streets, however, in a most deplorable condition. On every hand is ruin and devastation. Whole streets of houses rendered gaunt and windowless by the now-spent fires meet the eye everywhere. In certain places the ruins were still smoldering and in one or two districts the conflagration spread over an enormous area. Even if peace be declared, can London ever recover from this present wreck? Paris recovered, and quickly too. Therefore we place our faith in British wealth, British industry, and British patriotism. Yes, the tide has turned. The great revenge now in progress is truly a mad and bloody one. In Kilburn this afternoon there was a wholesale killing of a company of German infantry who, while marching along the high road, were set upon by the armed mob and practically exterminated. The smaller thoroughfares, Brondesbury Road, Victoria Road, Glendale Road, and Priory Park Road across the Paddington Cemetery were the scene of a frightful slaughter. The Germans died hard, but in the end were completely wiped out. German baiting is now indeed the Londoner's pastime, and on this dark and rainy afternoon hundreds of men of the fatherland have died upon the wet roads. Sitting here in a newspaper office as we do, and having fresh reports constantly before us, we are able to review the whole situation impartially. Every moment, through the various news agencies and our own correspondents and contributors, we are receiving fresh facts facts which all combine to show that von Kronhelm cannot hold out much longer. Surely the commander-in-chief of a civilized army will not allow his men to be massacred as they are now being. The enemy's troops, mixed up in the maze of London streets as they are, are utterly unable to cope with the oncoming multitudes, some armed with rifles and others with anything they can lay their hands upon. Women, wild, infuriated women, have now made their reappearance north of the Thames. In more than one instance where German soldiers have attempted to take refuge in houses, these women have obtained petrol and, with screams of fiendish delight, set the houses in question on fire. Awful dramas are being enacted in every part of the metropolis. The history of today is written in German blood. Lord Byfield has established temporary headquarters at Jack Straw's Castle, where von Kronhelm was during the bombardment, and last night we could see the signals exchanged between Hampstead and Sydenham Hill from whence General Bamford has not yet moved. Our cavalry in Essex are, it is said, doing excellent work. Lord Byfield has also sent a body of troops across from Gravesend to Tilbury 
and these have regained Malden and Southminster after some hard fighting. Advices from Gravesend state that further reinforcements are being sent across the river to operate against the east of London and hem in the Germans on that side. So confident is London of success that several of the railways are commencing to reorganize their traffic. A train left Willesden this afternoon for Birmingham, the first since the bombardment, while another has left Finsbury Park for Peterborough to continue to York if possible. So wrecked are the London termini, however, that it must be some weeks before trains can arrive or be dispatched from either Euston, King's Cross, Paddington, Marylebone, or St. Pancras. In many cases the line just north of the terminus is interrupted by a blown-up tunnel or a fallen bridge, therefore the termination of traffic must, for the present, be at some distance north on the outskirts of London. Shops are also opening in South London, though they have but little to sell. Nevertheless, this may be regarded as a sign of renewed confidence. Besides, supplies of provisions are now arriving, and the London County Council and the Salvation Army are distributing free soup and food in the lower-class districts. Private charity, everywhere abundant during the trying days of dark despair, is doing inestimable good among every class. The hard, grasping employer and the smug financier, who had hitherto kept scrupulous accounts, and have been noteworthy on account of their uncharitableness, have now, in the hour of need, come forward and subscribed liberally to the great mansion-house fund, opened yesterday by the deputy Lord Mayor of London. The subscription list occupies six columns of the issue of tomorrow's paper, and this in itself speaks well for the open-heartedness of the money classes of Great Britain. No movement has yet been made in the financial world bankers still remain with closed doors. The bullion seized at Southminster and other places is now under strong British guard, and will, it is supposed, be returned to the bank immediately. Only a comparatively small sum has yet been sent across to Germany. Therefore all von Kronhelm's strategy has utterly failed. By the invasion Germany has, up to the present moment, gained nothing." she has made huge demands at which we can afford to jeer. True, she has wrecked London, but have we not sent the greater part of her fleet to the bottom of the North Sea, and have we not created havoc in German ports? The leave-taking of our two gold spectacle censors was almost pathetic. We had come to regard them as necessities to puzzle and to play practical jokes of language upon. Today, for the first time, we have received none of those official notices in German with English translations, which of late have appeared so prominently in our columns. The German eagle is gradually disentangling his talons from London, and means to escape us, if he can. 10.30 p.m. Private information has just reached us from a most reliable source that a conference has been arranged between von Kronhelm and Lord Byfield. This evening the German field marshal sent a messenger to the British headquarters at Hampstead under a flag of truce. He bore a dispatch from the German commander asking that hostilities should be suspended for twenty-four hours and that they should make an appointment for a meeting during that period. Von Kronhelm has left the time and place of meeting to Lord Byfield and has informed the British commander that he has sent telegraphic instruction to the German military commanders of Birmingham, Sheffield, Manchester, Bradford, Leeds, Northampton, Stafford, Oldham, Wigan, Bolton, and other places, giving notice of his suggestion to the British, and ordering that for the present hostilities on the part of the Germans shall be suspended. It seems more than likely that the German field marshal has received these very definite instructions by wireless telegraph from the Emperor at Bremen or Potsdam. We understand that Lord Byfield, after a brief consultation by telegraph with the government at Bristol, has sent a reply. Of its nature, however, nothing is known, and at the moment of writing hostilities are still in progress. In an hour's time we shall probably know whether the war is to continue or a truce is to be proclaimed. Midnight. Lord Byfield has granted a truce, and hostilities have now been suspended. London has gone mad with delight, for the German yoke is cast off. Further information, which has just reached us from private sources, 
states that thousands of prisoners have been taken by Lord Byfield today, and that von Kronhelm has acknowledged his position to be absolutely hopeless. The German army has been defeated by our British patriots, who have fought so valiantly and so well. It is not likely that the war will be resumed. Von Kronhelm received a number of British officers at the war office half an hour ago, and it is said that he is already making preparations to vacate the post he has usurped. Lord Byfield has issued a reassuring message to London, which we have just received with instructions to print. It declares that although for the moment only a truce is proclaimed, yet this means the absolute cessation of all hostilities. The naval news of the past few days may be briefly summarized. The British main fleet entered the North Sea, and our submarines did most excellent work in the neighborhood of the mass lightship. Prince Stahlberger had concentrated practically the whole of his naval force off Lostock, but a desperate battle was fought about seventy miles from the Texel, full details of which are not yet to hand. All that is known is that, having now regained command of the sea, we were enabled to inflict a crushing defeat upon the Germans, in which the German flagship was sunk. In the end, sixty-one British ships were concentrated against seventeen German, with the result that the German fleet has practically been wiped out, there being nineteen thousand of the enemy's officers and men on the casualty list, the greatest recorded in any naval battle. Whatever may be the demands for indemnity on either side, one thing is absolutely certain, namely, that the invincible German army and navy are completely vanquished. The eagle's wings are trailing in the dust. End of chapter four. Recording by Tom Weiss, Tom's Audiobooks dot com. Chapter five of the invasion by William Lequeux. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Weiss. Chapter five. How the war ended. Days passed. Weary, waiting, anxious days. A whole month went by. What had really happened at sea was unknown. After the truce, London very gradually began to resume her normal life, though the gaunt state of the streets was indescribably weird. Shops began to open, and as each day passed food became more plentiful and consequently less dear. The truce meant the end of the war, therefore thanksgiving services were held in every town and village throughout the country. There were great prison camps of Germans at Hounslow, Brentwood, and Barnett, while von Kronhelm and his chief officers were also held as prisoners until some decision through diplomatic channels could be arrived at. Meanwhile, a little business began to be done. Thousands began to resume their employment, bankers reopened their doors, and within a week the distress and suffering of the poor became perceptibly alleviated. The task of burying the dead after the terrible massacre of the Germans in the London streets had been a stupendous one, but so quickly had it been accomplished that an epidemic was happily averted. Parliament moved back to Westminster, and daily meetings of the Cabinet were being held in Downing Street. These resulted in the resignation of the Ministry, and with a fresh Cabinet, in which Mr. Gerald Graham, the organizer of the Defenders, was given a seat, a settlement was at last arrived at. To further describe the chaotic state of England occasioned by the terrible and bloody war would serve no purpose. The loss and suffering which it had caused the country had been incalculable. Statisticians estimated that in one month of hostilities it had amounted to five hundred million pounds, a part of which represented money transferred from British pockets to German, as the enemy had carried off some of the securities upon which the German troops had laid their hands in London. Let us for a moment take a retrospective glance. Consuls were at fifty, bread was still at one shilling sixpence per loaf, and the ravages of the German commerce destroyers had sent up the cost of insurance on British shipping sky high. Money was almost unprocurable, except for the manufacture of war material, there was no industry, and the suffering and distress among the poor could not be exaggerated. In all directions, men, women, and children had been starving. 
the mercantile community were loud in their outcry for peace at any price, and the pro-German and Stop the War Party were equally vehement in demanding a cessation of the war. They found excuses for the enemy, and forgot the frightful devastation and loss which the invasion had caused to the country. They insisted that the working class gained nothing, even though the British fleet was closely blockading the German coast, and their outcry was strengthened when a few days after the blockade of the Elde had begun, two British battleships were so unfortunate as to strike German mines and sink with a large part of their crews. The difficulty of borrowing money for the prosecution of the war was a grave obstacle in the way of the party of action, and preyed upon the mind of the British government. Socialism, with its creed of, Thou shalt have no other god but thyself, and its doctrine, Let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die, had replaced the religious beliefs of a generation of Englishmen taught to suffer and to die sooner than surrender to wrong. In the hour of trial, amidst smoking ruins, among the holocausts of dead which marked the prolonged, bloody, and terrible battles on land and at sea, the spirit of the nation quailed, and there was really no great leader to recall it to ways of honor and duty. The wholesale destruction of food, and particularly of wheat and meat, removed from the world's market a large part of its supplies, and had immediately sent up the cost of food everywhere, outside the United Kingdom as well as in it. At the same time the attacks upon shipping laden with food increased the cost of insurance to prohibitive prices upon vessels freighted for the United Kingdom. The underwriters after the first few captures by the enemy would not insure at all except for fabulous rates. The withdrawal of all the larger British cruisers for the purpose of defeating the main German fleets in the North Sea left the commerce destroyers a free hand, and there was no force to meet them. The British liners commissioned as commerce protectors were too few and too slow to be able to hold their adversaries in check. Neutral shipping was molested by the German cruisers. Whenever raw cotton or food of any kind was discovered upon a neutral vessel bound for British ports, the vessel was seized and sent into one or other of the German harbors on the west coast of Africa. The United Kingdom, indeed, might have been reduced to absolute starvation had it not been for the fact that the Canadian government interfered in Canada to prevent similar German tactics from succeeding and held the German contracts for the cornering of Canadian wheat contrary to public policy. The want of food, the high price of bread and meat in England, and the greatly increased cost of the supplies of raw materials sent up the expenditure upon poor relief to enormous figures. Millions of men were out of employment and in need of assistance. Mills and factories in all directions had closed down, either because of the military danger from the operations of the German armies, or because of the want of orders, or again because raw materials were not procurable. Unfortunately, when the invasion began, many rich foreigners who had lived in England collected what portable property they possessed, and retired abroad to Switzerland, Italy, and the United States. Their example was followed by large numbers of British subjects who had invested abroad, and now, in the hour of distress, were able to place their securities in a handbag and withdraw them to happier countries. They may justly be blamed for this one of patriotism, but their reply was that they had been unjustly and mercilessly taxed by men who derided patriotism, misused power, and neglected the real interest of the nation in the desire to pander to the mob. Moreover, with the income tax at three shillings sixpence in the pound, and with the cost of living enormously enhanced, they declared that it was a positive impossibility to live in England, while into the bargain their lives were exposed to danger from the enemy. As a result of this wholesale emigration, in London and the country the number of empty houses inordinately increased, and there were few well-to-do people left to pay the rates and taxes. The fearful burden of the extravagant debts which the British municipalities had heaped up was cruelly felt, since the nation had to repudiate the responsibility which it had incurred for the payment of interest on the local debts. The socialist dream, in fact, might also be said to have been realized. There were few rich left, but the consequences to the poor, instead of being beneficial, were utterly disastrous. 
under the pressure of public opinion, constrained by hunger and financial necessities, and with thousands of German prisoners in their hands, the British government acceded to the suggested conference to secure peace. Peace was finally signed on January 13, 1911. The British Empire emerged from the conflict outwardly intact, but internally so weakened that only the most resolute reforms accomplished by the ablest and boldest statesmen could have restored it to its old position. Germany, on the other hand, emerged with an additional 21,000 miles of European territory, with an extended seaboard on the North Sea fronting the United Kingdom at Rotterdam and the Texel, and, it was calculated, with a slight pecuniary advantage. Practically the entire cost of the war had been borne by England. As is always the case, the poor suffered most. The socialists, who had declared against armaments, were faithless friends of those whom they professed to champion. Their dream of a golden age proved utterly delusive. But the true authors of England's misfortunes escaped blame for the moment, and the army and navy were made the scapegoats of the great catastrophe. When success did come, it came too late and could not be utilized without a great British army capable of carrying the war into the enemy's country and thus compelling a satisfactory peace. This is the end of the invasion by William Lequeux. Recording by Tom Weiss. Tom's audiobooks dot com